Hello and welcome to Sunday Live. What's happening, people? What's going on? How you guys doing? I believe this is 184, week 184. And we're here to talk about all things guitar. Did you guys see the video I did for this this week? That's a unique pedal right there. Sure it is. Fuzz filters, LFOs, fun stuff from Solid Gold FX. Really nice stuff. I believe Canada. I think that's where these are made. Yep, made in Canada. It says right there. My homeland. Anyways, really unique, fun pedal. And I like the weird little piece of music that I was able to come up with with this. Um, so check that out if you haven't seen it yet. What else did I do? A video for the Headrush little guy, the Mazda Miata MX-5 modeler. Uh, <clears throat> kind of a, a neat little unit if you're uh, not familiar with the Headrush stuff. It's pretty cool. Really nice price point. I think it's like $3.99, something like that. Built-in expression pedal. And basically, as far as I know, I'm not 100% sure, but it seems to be like similar in power and all that to the bigger versions. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be joined by my buddy Dave Friedman here in a few minutes. Um, loosely, I mentioned around noon to him. So we'll see maybe 20 minutes or so. And we, we have to we have yet to do our wrap up of our pickup video. So I thought, why not just do it on a live stream? Because we can just and then it's like killing two birds with one stone. It's easy. You just knock it out on a live stream. Seems to be the ultimate uh, way to do it, the easiest way to do it, the proper way to do it rather than film it and edit it and put it. You know, why not do it like this? Then you guys can ask questions and stuff, too. Uh, so we'll talk about all those pickups, the 23 different pickups that we uh, we checked out and what conclusions we came to and all that uh somebody's asking it's frank is asking uh any change to the pedal board lately you know um that's an interesting thing i'm actually experimenting right now with a, a this wet dry wet thing just for fun and kind of for something i have coming up that i'm not going to tell you what it is yet but um back here i have uh, it's hard to see but the comments are sitting there. I'm not using that right now, but there's three cabs, my PT-212 and then two Sir 112s on either side. And then over here, I kind of can't see that either, but I've got a Matrix power amp and a Quad Cortex. <laughs> and I'm running three up. Uh, my Matrix is uh, a three channel. The G, what's it called? The uh, 1500, I believe it's called. GT-1500 has three channels. And so you can do wet, dry, wet with it really easy. Run the center dry channel and then uh, do, you know, to outside cabs of effects and stuff. So I'm playing around with that. That's kind of a new thing. Uh, it's just for, you know, something that, but I, I, you never know. I mean, it's like, I was thinking about it. I can actually easy do, easily do this with the PT-15. I could take the loaded down output out of the PT-15 with no speaker simulation. You know, don't even need a load box because it has one, because we did that. Uh, and I could run that into the quad cortex and then have it center dry and then two outside effects and it actually be like a tiny wet dry wet rig except you need the cabinets which is never tiny yeah so there's that okay up there in the super chat it's arthur and he says supporting the rock and rolling thank you my friend thanks for thanks for uh doing the uh the super chat i appreciate that uh uh, well, L. Scott Music says you should, really should try wet, dry, wet with a space station. You can borrow mine. But I have things I can do it with. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, I, I have uh, so many different things here with uh, these kinds of capabilities with multiple outputs and stuff like that. Uh, the Quad Cortex works great. I mean, for it, you know, you can get a stereo delay. It's a little confusing at first to figure out how to pan effects and just to get a stereo delay going the the main complaint with that unit is is the effects i think and that they need to get more stuff going and implemented in it because it's really great in many ways but like to get a stereo delay going with different taps on each side it's a little complicated i ended up using two mono delays panning them and to figure out the panning i know how to do it now but it took me you know a minute I, I, I knew, I think, when I first got it, and then I forgot. And it's like, oh, yeah, you have to go like this, and then you go in this thing, and you create a split, and then you go here and push that, and that gives you pan controls. You know, so then I figured it out. So I had to do, you know, to, to do, say, like an even tide 
pitch nine up, nine down thing, micro pitch thing. You take two pitch blocks and you do one up and one down, and then you need to paint. It's just a little bit complex. Um, it would be nice if they just kind of in their effects. You know how on like the line six, the helix or whatever, the stereo delay, or maybe you don't, but like, you know, if you've got a stereo delay, you've got, you can set the delay time in a stereo delay, like the vintage digital or whatever. And then you just pull the slider for uh, like time. It's kind of like gives you like a, at a hundred percent, it's the same delay and it's basically mono, but you go to 98 and now one side will, let's say it's 400 milliseconds. One side will be 401 and the other side will be 398 or whatever. And then as you, or whatever, and then you go down to 50% and now it gives you a, like 250 and 500 or 200 and 400 or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And their stereo delays. Uh, it's just really easy is what I'm getting at. And it's a little bit more complicated in the, in the quad cortex, but boy, do they sound good. I mean, the effects sound great. So. There you have it. Eric, what's up? I got to run, but I'll definitely catch the replay. Ask Dave if you ever heard back about Dean and Motor City pickups. Uh, did you see Dave's uh, er, er, tone talk with Dean DeLeo? That was great. I really like Dean. He's such a nice guy, which comes across in that video. He's very, very nice. Uh, and he's, you know, obviously he's done some great stuff with Sun Temple Pilots. And we wish him lots more success and lots of great music in the future. It was a nice show. Really nice show. Uh, that wet dry wet rig would make a nice video. I guess it would. I might do that. That's G-Man music saying that. Uh, what do we got here? How many amps do I have? I don't, I don't actually know. I don't have to count. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Probably, probably in the neighborhood of like 20 or something like that. Too many. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You said you aren't ready to give up your tubes yet. No, I'm not. Uh, the the reason that I'm trying this with the quad cortex and the matrix is for some travel thing that um, that I need to do that uh, would just be easier. You know, it's a, a, a thing where I'm looking at maybe having to fly and uh, and how do I deal with that with not you know I haven't been on a plane in two years so you know the Okay, a little less than two years. I was on lots of planes two years ago, but come February of 2020, then I'll quit. But you know what I mean? I haven't been on a plane since then. So it's just like a little daunting thinking about flying to, to go do things. Like, what am I going to bring? What's that going to be like? So a small, small system, like a matrix I can throw in a suitcase, you know, the power amp. And then quad cortex, I can throw in a little board with a couple other things and little pelican case or whatever and just fly it it'll be, it'll be powerful and cool uh yeah 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 uh what else we got here here to support the daily caffeine intake i gotta be uh thankful for that thank you very much have you seen mammoth uh live yet no you know they had a uh a, a whiskey show that got canceled and then they played the, uh, you're going tomorrow night in Seattle, you say. Uh, they played with Guns N' Roses here two nights ago, uh, <coughs> which I didn't go to. It was at a big new stadium. I would have liked to have gone, but um, that didn't happen. I was doing other things, so I didn't. But, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I would like to see him one of these days. One of these days, one of these days. Uh, what's that? Uh, thank you, for, uh, Reza, for the coffee, uh, the coffee support. I appreciate that. Um, I really wanted to know what it was like to work with Chester on the high rise. He really captured the Scott Wyland vibe and essence without trying to imitate. You know, I, I knew Chester uh, because we did the Lincoln Park tour in 2008. So I hung out with that guy a little bit, and um, he also sang Hunger Strike with us every night with Chris on that tour. So probably, I don't know, that was a pretty good long run, at least 30 dates or something like that. So I think I sang, you know, we I played Hunger Strike with him 30 times. <laughs> he was a sweet guy. Uh, he, he was a dude that I remember, uh, he was a really hard worker. Okay, the first thing, my first Chester story is that I actually saw him break his arm with, because we did a... Uh, uh, the first thing we did with Lincoln Park was an Australia run in uh, late 2007. 
we did a, a week or so with Lincoln Park starting in New Zealand and then went to Australia and did Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, you know, did all the, the, the run there, Brisbane, uh, which was a lot of fun. So that was the, actually the first run we did with them. And uh, he was really cool then. And then I remember the next summer, of course, we do the Lincoln Park. I guess that's probably when they solidified that Chris would do the, the Lincoln Park Project Revolution tour the next summer, which is like a festival thing that they did. Or like a, it was like a mini festival with had, had a bunch of different bands and a couple of different stages and stuff. And we were direct support for Lincoln Park on the, on the A stage. So we would play around 7 or 7.30 or whatever. And the first time the fans at Seachester every night, and there's a lot of Lincoln Park fans there, was with us because we would do Hunger Strike. He'd come walking out and they would all go berserk and stuff. And then we would play that song. Anyways, um, I just remember uh, him being uh, the most visibly present of any of those guys. He would be there every day, like all day uh, at the festivals doing, uh, you know, just kind of overseeing things and stuff like that. And he was really nice. And I remember sitting with him many times in the catering or at lunch and stuff. And we would talk and he was just, he was very cool. He was really down to earth. Sweet, sweet, sweet guy, you know? And uh, yeah. And then the last time I saw him was at Chris's service when Chris passed away. And he sang Hallelujah at Chris's funeral. And it was beautiful uh, with the guitar player from Lincoln Park. I don't know how he did that. You know, how he held it together. But he, he knocked it out of the park, that's for sure. And then two months later, he was gone. So that's that sad story. But my memories of him were that he was just a, a really sweet guy. And I remember saying to him that uh, at the service, I said, you know, that tour, man, that summer tour, it was like summer camp. It was really fun. I re I've got great memories of that tour and um, parking lot parties and, you know, everybody hanging out from all the different bands and stuff. And it becomes like a, a really fun family for at least, you know, a month or month and a half or whatever that we were out. We had a really good time. And I said, man, that was one of my favorite summers on memory, you know, that I can remember. It was so fun. He said, me too. You know, it was really great. And so we had a good little talk. And uh, Anyway, that's that story. JSL project up there in the top chat for the coffee and scotch chart. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those just joining. Dave Friedman will join me soon. I hope don't see him down in the, uh, in the waiting room, the virtual waiting room yet, but I sent him the link and he's supposed to be here. So we're going to talk about pickups and the Eddie Van Halen tone and just pickups in general and stuff. Uh, I missed a super chat says Christopher Butler. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, blah, 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 blah. How was the head rush compared to the new X MG30? Uh, I hate comparisons but I, 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 because I don't have them both right beside me here now. Both good. I think the new X is less money, right? Um, they were both really good. I would say the head rush is maybe a little more advanced. I don't know, beyond it. Um, but I got great tones out of the little Numex, too. And I think it's $100 less. I could be wrong about that. So I hate this because I don't... When you Sometimes I get put on the spot about stuff like that. And then I'm like, I'm going to say the wrong shit. And then somebody's going to be mad at me. But anyways, um, head rush is a... You know, it's, a, it's the old 11 rack format. So it's tried and true and kind of like, you know, it's been around and if you're familiar with head rush and you like their people are in the different modeling camps it's almost like you could have the head rush and then you could have the uh, you know the axe effects you know and the and the uh, floorboard and and then the, you know the helix and and people get in their different camps because they get used to i think there's a lot of how, getting used to using it and programming it and how to do things and how to map the expression pedal and all that stuff and it's like they'll all do a good job um, but once you get used to it, it's like learning Pro Tools and then like you got to go to Logic. Well, should I get Logic? Is it better than Pro Tools? Well, define better and like how much time you want to spend learning a new thing, you know, because there's that too and they all work. So, I don't know. Is that the answer you wanted to hear? Probably not really. Uh, probably not really. Did I miss any other Super Chats? Is there another one that I... I don't, I don't think so. Or did I? Uh... No, I think that's all. Yeah. Um, what about the Ambicab, says uh, Leonel. Am I saying your name right? I hope so. Leonel. Uh, 
the Ambicab is great. It's a little different. Ambicab is, uh, you don't, the, the, the thing with the wet, dry, wet uh, with the three cabinets, it's a little bit more of the Steve Stevens, Eddie Van Halen kind of like where you do mix a lot of dry into the outside cabs and you use the regular speakers like Greenbacks or V30s or whatever. The Ambicab has these two little speakers in it that are like fives or eights or something. And I wouldn't really want to put dry in those because they don't sound like Celestians or whatever, but they're nice for the wet sounds, for the ambient sounds. So I think that that's the, uh, you're not really supposed to mix. That's the main thing. You're not really supposed to mix dry into the Ambicab. And it's a, it's a different thing, you know, it's a little bit of a different sound when you do. Uh, Stephen says you listen to the pickup multiple times, the shootout, and every time Pariah Black just stands above the rest. You know, I, I, I really like that pickup too. And um, I've got my black guitar, uh, the one with the maple neck. And I think I might switch out the pickup in that actually and put in maybe Pariah Black or Pariah White. I, I just haven't decided yet. Um, but uh, those Pariah pickups are really, really good. I, I totally agree. Uh, I, I'm personally, I'm a really big fan of the A2. 9k thing now i've come to realize that for that sound it's great but i'll tell you what there's no uh, like a good old custom custom is pretty nice too the C the seymour and the evh pickup which is really similar the 14k whatever it is uh uh a2 thing it's really good i'll, t I'll tell you what i'm gonna grab it because i've got it right here i brought it for the the show just one sec here where is it it's right here um for that thing, I have come to realize that this guitar, <laughs> the, just the, the EVH, you know, one that they're making now, is just really, really, really good for doing the Van Halen thing. And that s sounds like it should be obvious, but uh, I'll tell you what, this guitar for playing that style and the, the sound of it and everything, whether or not it's exactly because uh, Brian Wampa put up a video the other day that was good where he said, you know, people talk about the Van Halen sound, but here's three different isolated tracks of Eddie's guitar and the different tones that he got. And they're all like very different. And that's true from album to album to album. His sound, I mean, the sound from Van Halen 1 to Van Halen 2 changes dramatically with the kind of warmer, raw Van Halen 2 thing the more distorted kind of top end Van Halen one thing. And then we get to women and children first and it kind of like changes again. So we can talk about this stuff, but what I've kind of realized is, uh, well, actually I'm going to save this for the Dave portion of our show here. I'm going to save it. Uh, just because that's what we're going to talk about with him. And it'll be good. It'd be a good conversation. Tatted 1969 says, just want to say thanks for all the help. Thank you, man. Thank you for being here and always coming back and watching my stuff. I appreciate it. Uh, did you ever get a new neck for the black guitar? Hmm. Oh, I see what you're saying because you, uh, you're thinking of the gold guitar, actually. We talked about that, didn't we? I'm sorry about that, Ben. We were talking about the neck on that. It was for my gold one, and I haven't. That's not something I've done yet. So it's still the same neck on there, but we'll talk about that later privately. I might do a little swap with Ben for a neck. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, really, really, really like the Pryor White. Yeah, I did too. Really good. You know, the 78 was good too. The rewind version of it was really good. I just like that spec. And actually the Sur that was a prototype was really good too. It was just a little weaker. It was like 8.6K and... Um, and Elmico too, and I thought it sounded great too. So I've come to realize the uh, that that uh, 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 we're going to save it, and we'll talk about it with Dave. But I've come to realize that that spec works well for that sound, whether or not it's the exact. Once again, like Brian Wampler highlighted, there's differences from album to album. So what you got to do is just it's a best case average of them all. And if I'm going to play Van Halen, what would I do? Which is kind of what he did when he went and played live. You know, eventually, <laughs> you know, he ended up with whatever he ended up with, and did all the songs with that tone. And I, I just think that uh, for me, you could go either way. It's either the 9K A2 or the 14K A2. And that's what I think, you know, that uh, if you want a little more heat, which is what this guitar does so well. This guitar with the EVH pickup in it, it smokes for those sounds. It's great. It's really comfortable to play. Like my black guitar that I really like, but you know, the black one with the tortoise guard and the Floyd, it's got this squeaky top end on it. 
with the maple neck and the ash body because it's it's quite bright that guitar and then just a squeak to the top end and kind of like this little harsh sounding to me now and so that's why i think i'm gonna switch out that pickup for um you know definitely for 9k and maybe even 14k on the code too but probably a 9k in that guitar i think and that'll just warm up the top end a little bit i know it will because that's what all those pickups do they have this slightly more muted top end that won't work with everything but on a screaming plexi that can be pretty bright when you're diming the presence and the treble and all that stuff it like it's it's all some of the parts and stuff and it just works well for playing that stuff you know so um that's an interesting question uh Isegger, uh do you enjoy modding guitars you generally keep them stock it, you know it depends on the guitar many times i'll keep them stock i mean like when i think about like my dave grohl guitar or something i haven't changed a thing on that guitar it's just fine as long as it's got a good setup and everything that it's got the original pickups in it which i think are burst buckers or something um you know my yaren the only thing i changed on my yaren is the tuners got a little funky after a while so i put a set of historic tuners on it because the tuners were getting the, he's got these you know really cool looking vintage tuners with the right buttons and stuff but they were getting this weird kind of thing going on with them so uh yeah um so what else uh i wonder if i should email dave the code i sent it to his texted it to him but i don't know if that's good enough i'm just gonna share with him the code here just give me two seconds so that we know he's got it because i don't see him in the waiting room and i have to give him shit uh, oh, link. Link. i'm gonna send him a text and see if he's coming and join us here Actually, let's just call him and give him shit. How about that? Why don't we just do that? Who else we got here? Let's see. Dan, the tube man's here. Anthony. Uh, uh -huh. We'll answer George's question here in a minute. Yeah. Are you joining me soon? Okay, I'll see you in a minute. But probably on the pot or something. Uh, <laughs> hello from Scotland. With a Marshall gain amp, uh, would you stick to G12 amps for a Van Halen kind of thing, or would you go creambacks? I'd go G12 amps, but the creambacks are good. The, the 65s for that sound are nice. They're just a little meatier. Um, I just just go with the regular. You know, I mean, or the heritage, but I, I really like this, the regular old, you know, uh, greenbacks, $99 or whatever they are for that sound. Break them in and they sound really good. It's just it's a very comfortable sound for me. Uh, you know, just, just why mess around? Why mess around? Wow, there's a big old super chat up there. I have no idea what d denomination that is, but uh, he's from Russia. What's happening over there? In Russia, it's been a minute since I've been there. What's the most realistic sounding load box in your opinion? Uh, well, the ones that, that uh, do the uh, the 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 most accurate impedance curve are to me on the market. To me, the uh, the Sur, the Fractal X load, which is really 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 similar. Uh, and the, um, as far as the load goes, and the Fryette gets honorable mention. It's really quite close to, to the actual impedance curve that a speaker looks like if you were to plot it out. Um, and then, you know, after that, you've got your kind of your U-shaped curve devices, which are like the two notes units, the, uh, the aux. Also good, you know, just slightly not quite as as close but they do a great job you know they're good units so but i would say the sur and the fractal are are definitely the closest with the the fry out with honorable mention coming in third which works great and i use it all the time the power station uh for a reamp device here's my my favorite re <coughs> reamp unit and it'll work well for direct recording too uh, yeah but pete isn't that black guitar the one eddie and matt love the sound of yeah <laughs> It is. <laughs> That's the one that Ed was like, 
what, what pickups in that guitar? No, I'm talking about changing it. That's us guitar players. I'd be hard pressed to change any on that one. Yeah, you're making me think about it, Stephen. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't, but it's just a pickup. I can always put it back in. You know, he he would he would have supported that. He put pickups in every day. <laughs> he was switching shit constantly. You know, but yeah, that when I did the original the 5150 video and I uh, the pedal, and then I was at 5150 showing him the 5150 video uh, as it started to play. Ed Ed looked at Matt and because they were sitting in front of me at the at the, the computer screen and they were sitting there and they started watching it and I played it was like two bars went by and Ed looked at Matt and he goes sounds good and they both turned to me at the same time and go what pickups in that guitar <laughs> so yeah you're right it has a Motor City uh second degree black belt which is a great pickup and I've liked it for a long long time um but it's I just noticed yesterday playing around with it it is a little it's a little squeaky in that guitar, you know, which is something I probably always liked about it. But just because I've been playing around with that sound a lot and stuff lately, and um, it's just, it's starting to, I don't know, I don't know, just grate on me a little bit on my ears. Um, and I'm really in, like, I, I'm just, well, Dave's here now. I can see him in the, uh, in the thing, the jig. So I'll just take one more super chat here and then uh, we'll let Dave in and, and we'll, uh, start our conversation about pickups. Arthur says, here's a kick I learned recently. If you take the Eddie sound of 1984 and drop the effects a lot and kick in the gain, it becomes the balance tone. I mean, I guess. Um, let's talk about that with Dave. Because things, I mean, this is actually when Dave started getting involved in the rigs and stuff towards the, the mid to late 90s and stuff. And Dave can comment on this. Uh, let, let's just say hello to him, shall we? And he can be a part of this. Hello. Hey, what's happening? What's going on? How you doing? I'm fine. Yeah? He seems so close. <laughs> yeah? It's a bigger uh, screen. Uh, we're, uh, we're just talking about this super chat that's up here. If you take the Eddie sound of 1984 and drop the effects a lot and kick in the gain it becomes the balance tone was was he moving away from the harmonizers at that point by balance or was that still full even time well, that was still there yeah he didn't move away from that till late after all the records that they had done really like the 98 tour sure yeah. Sharon period oh, no, right? no 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 well yes i get no he still had it then too did he really yeah he okay. had it until i did the rig which is 2003. Uh, yeah, yes, I think. It's all a blur. <laughs> I, look, I look at that now and I go, God, it's almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Holy crap. I know. <laughs> you think about that. If, if this was the 80s, it would be the early 60s. That you would have done that. Isn't that weird? Like you think about 1980, that would have been like before the Beatles. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. That's I, how I, think about I, I don't like to think about this. <laughs> Just goes, God, we're old. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't have to think about it. Um, but yeah, I think that the sound was pretty different, actually, to tell you the truth, just because it was largely we had the preamp gain situation. I mean, from 84 well, uh, to. On balance, he did use the Marshall. Oh, did he? With with the um, PV. Did he? Yeah. And he used the Marshall on, on uh, for unlawful carnal knowledge, right? A little bit? No. Oh, he didn't. Not that really. was all. Hmm. That was Soldano almost. Yeah, Soldano okay. through a seventy-five watt cabinet, right? Which he rented from Andy Browers, which later he bought from Andy Browers. Okay, it's a slam cap. Such a I different think. sounding record. That record, the the uh, it's a good sounding record. I mean, obviously you got and you got so many factors there. Different amp, Andy Johns, and like um, the, not to mention when I listened to it a while ago, it's like, oh yeah, he's playing a lot of neck pickup. Or middle position and yeah. wah wah and baritone, and it's like there's all kinds of different shit going on in that. Record. It's a good, that's a good, really good sounding record for sort of modern Van Halen. Definitely, I think, I think maybe maybe one of the better ones. Yeah, I mean, Run Around, that's a great tune. Yeah, great. So there's some good stuff on there. Some really cool, really cool stuff. God, man, this there's a great uh, Instagram EVH solos is the Instagram if you want to check it out, but. 
uh, somebody put up a, a clip from that tour, 91. And um, the, check it out on Instagram. It came out a day or two ago, so you'll see it. But Eddie's playing the yellow music man. And he rips this solo in that clip. This guy's Instagram is great because he picks some great moments to put up. And it's all Eddie's ripping solos, you know. Uh, and and he's just fucking blazing on that solo. Like, he's just so fluid and just like, it's just all over it. It's just, I don't know what song it was. It was, uh, I don't even remember. Oh, maybe uh, All Fire or uh, Naturally Wired or something, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. AFU or whatever that song was called. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting song. record too. OU812. There's a couple yeah. really there's a couple really cool songs on that. Oh, absolutely. I always like Mine All Mine. That was my favorite on that track. Totally cool. It's totally like It's a great song. Yeah. Just there's great songs on those records. I want to get more like uh, 5150 is a great song. That riff is amazing. You know, such a cool song, the way it halftime and the verse and everything. And it's, 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 it's and the moves into the double time B section and then it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's, 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 it's kind of, I, I felt that I like it. There's a little bit of the lazy era. The very, you said era. that, but I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on that tune. I know what you mean uh, on that. Yeah. Nah, 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 well, I, nah. I think there's some stuff on the record after it, though, that was pretty burning. So, uh, it, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It, it's interesting to listen as it, as the years go on, you know? <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, well, uh, so let's talk about uh, the pickups. Um, you know, What's your feel on what we discovered from? Did you did you have any discoveries from from making that video? Um, I mean, I, I think I think uh, you know basically there's two flavors, and I think there was uh, there was the more P P A F ish flavor of Ed, and then there was the rip and distortion pickup uh, flavor. So yep. you know uh, the Demarzio distortion, be it original or or reissue even uh, or reissue uh, current. Because the one we did in that video was current, um, was a great sound. The original Mighty Might, which is a copy of the Distortion, was a really good sound in that in that video. I agree. I, I think that was pretty epic. Yeah. Um, the Mighty Might was killer, and the, the Super Distortion was great too. But yeah. I wish we would have tried, and actually we could still do this. But in the Destroyer, I'd like to AB that original Mighty Might with the new Super Distortion and see how close they are. In that same guitar, that'd be cool. It's just here, the original. Oh yeah, well yeah. The might because we didn't try the mighty might in the destroyer. Might be also interesting to pull pull your your super distortion out of your gold guitar that you have the original super distortion. And yeah, AB it, and AB it to the new super distortion in the Explorer. Yeah, true. Great, more videos. <laughs> yeah, another video. <laughs> How close and, and better yet, what I always say that comes into play in this. And that we don't know and that we haven't done, which I still think we should should visit, is we really don't know what pot value is in his guitar. Right. Knowing him, it was whatever was laying on the bench mm. was how that came about with no regard for what value it is. Well, but wouldn't he have bought the pot from, because that guitar as it existed, remember when it was first put together with the, it had a, a, some sort of zebra pickup in it and, it and the natural finished body and it was together for like a month and we've seen pictures of it, yeah, right? Yeah. He, I would assume that the the pot would have come from Wayne and the output jack and the, he probably just, because he needed parts. And why wouldn't that have been a 250K? Could be, but I would, think that if Wayne was involved and it was a humbucker, he might have been like, you want this one, which is a 500k. It was, you know what? That wasn't so cut and dry back then. Yeah. No. I mean, like, mm -hmm. the original Gibson's used 300k's. I don't know about that. I think they were 500, but then they went to 300. I think. The original Gibson's. I think the original Gibson's were 500. Like, I, I know for a fact that, well, you just don't know. That's the, that's the funny thing. <laughs> No, and, and, and here and here's the thing uh, the different not only will it change the top end it also tends to change how the how the mid-range seems in the pickup um, 
I know for a fact a 250K pickup with, let's say, uh, the Duncan 59, that was, I think, the very last one we did, mm -hmm. um, is really cool and way makes that pickup sound different. Oh, I'm sure. It takes the top end edge off. Yeah. And gives it a little more of a mid hump. Sure. And uh, and it sounds really good that way. I mean, it's just capacitance, right? Essentially. Yeah. It's capacitance. There's so much at play with that. You know, what, uh, you know, how long was the cable? What was the cable? Yeah. Uh, the length and the brand of cable at the time. Well, you, know? you probably saw, uh, I was mentioning the other day that, um, that, uh, Brian Waffler put up a video uh, where he just played some of the solo the isolated Van Halen tracks from the different tunes. I don't know where he got them, maybe off of the, you know, the, the Guitar Hero isolated stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he played a few of the isolated and because he's like people always talk about the Van Halen sound. But like, what is the Van Halen sound? And he's absolutely right. Like from album to album to album, it changed so much from tune to tune to tune. And so the difference, I mean, I've been listening to that stuff a lot lately. And, you know, like Van Halen tunes. Right. You're, Van Halen 2 is your favorite, uh, and that's I, I would tend to agree that that record sounds amazing. Like the guitar tone, that raw. I think the whole record, oh, yeah. It's so I, good. Like the drums sound really good. The you bass do. sounds really good. Like yeah. as a whole, I think maybe that record was the best sounding of all the records. Yeah, um, and I've always, I kind of argue that Women and Children First, there was, it sort of took a, a dive, certainly in the guitar tone. I mean, I love yeah, a lot sorta, of it. It was cool too, though. I mean, eh. it, well, it to me, it, brighter and more reverby for sure. That's, and, you that's know, it. That's but, the but there's some really ripping, oh, ripping, yeah. you know, stuff on that that is just mean as hell. Oh, absolutely. But I'm just talking about the tone, the brighter, the brighter yeah. reverb. Is exactly the problem that I have with it's just not quite as clear. Like Van Halen 2 is just the perfect tone and and, and reverb and all that. Pretty much altogether, I think so. But you can't argue with you know the opening of women and children first, you know, and 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 just with all the little noises and squeaks and all the you know that's fun. oh you made everybody want some. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. amazing. amazing. I mean, the performance never faltered, you know. So, here, I mean, here's the thing: like knowing him and working with him over the years, it's it was just like he would just experiment with everything and anything. Mm -hmm. And literally, when I said he'd probably grab whatever pot was laying on the bench, it literally probably was whatever pot was in the pile on the bench. Right. But we didn't even look at it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. so, so that's good. That's good insight. So we don't know. Yeah, we don't. And, and and maybe it doesn't matter. Because <laughs> uh, it, it all, well, it matters, but so does the guitar, and so does the wood, and so does everything. You well, know, so like, like you were talking about the second degree black belt. So, yeah. I don't think personally the second degree black belt in an ash guitar is the right choice. Yeah. And ash is such a hard wood, and maybe it's too. so. Um, got so much crack to it you know like when you when you hit the strings it almost doesn't it has more wallop than tone hmm. if, if that makes sense so yeah. so i mean personally i've always used the second degree black belt in an alder guitar mm -hmm. now in an alder guitar it sounds pretty dead nuts on van halen too hmm. not as much in the ash guitar yeah so that's I where that's where the 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 Alnico two comes in, which kind of softens what sure. the, the ash is doing. Um, well, and that's why I think that that makes a lot of sense. That that was probably you know the Seymour rewind or whatever, at least for a minute in Eddie's guitar. That makes sense to me because it's like the top end is not. It, it, my guitar is cool, like the black guitar, and it was funny because I was saying I'm thinking about switching it, and then somebody was saying, "Wasn't that the pickup that Ed said that he liked?" <laughs> he asked you yeah. what it was in that guitar, and I'm like, "Yeah." yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, I actually think you should just leave that guitar alone. Because Maybe, but I was just playing it yesterday. Very successful like, videos and stuff in it. Yeah, I know you're right, but I was playing it yesterday, and it's just really, you know what? It works great into, um, you know how I uh, like like uh, my, my amp by PT, which is like sort of like a modded 800 yeah. kind of front end, uh, yeah. or or your amp, you know, the BE or something. Yeah. It's it's not quite as wild on the top end. Any of these amps, 
um, when you add the extra gain stage and all that, they tend to warm up a little bit. And like every time I play my SL68 or whatever, it's just a little more like, oh yeah, it's a little more wild on the top end and the presence cranked and maybe the 100K off the forearm tap feedback and all that, like all that shit. It's just a yeah. wild sound. Yeah. And what I've come to realize is that for that thing, now I get like, okay, yeah, an A2 tends to just be a nice rounding off of the edges on the top end because it just gets it's a it's a formula you know it's a, it's a recipe well right? that, that's that's the thing so 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 that might just be the thing for the ash guitar right exactly so now if you put like for instance if you put an a2 pickup in your your evh guitar that's a basswood body yeah i bet you wouldn't like it no no but that's what this well, that is. is an a2 isn't it in that guitar but that pickup that pickup to me, yeah. even though it's an A2, yeah, is really like metal and metallic sounding. Really? Yeah, because the, the guitar I have, the other Wolfgang out there, yeah, if you plug it into anything, it's got like this sizzling top end compared to other pickups. That's interesting because even I'll tell you it what, A2, it just sizzles. When I compared this to my black guitar the other day, as well as my Wolfgang, uh -huh. the top end is way smooth. On my Wolfgang, it's got a big, grindy, warm. And I, I that. Hmm? Same pickup. Same pickup. Very yeah, different sound the, between this guitar that. and the Wolfgang. But anyways, I digress. I will say, okay, so let's let's talk about the pickup specifically. Like, if we go through them, I should have made a list of all of them here in front of me. But like the category, like the, the I, I I agree with you that the A5 could be the right thing, and even like the Duncan Fifty Nine was pretty cool. And I, and I got to say, having I'm going to contradict myself, but the the uh, bare knuckle the Van Halen, the, the VH2 yeah. bare knuckle, that was a great sounding pickup. Sure. And that's 8.9 K uh, Alnico Five, and whatever he does with the wind and everything, that pickup just sounded great. And I wouldn't. But it still I, got the brighter attack. Yeah, maybe not as much as the second degree black belt. So I would agree that to, it just depends what you want. I mean, maybe the brighter attack is what, like, once again, going into an 800 or my PT100 or something, an A5 in the Ash guitar could be just the thing, but just into the real plexi, because it's all a recipe. I'm digging the A2 thing, you know? So the, the, I mean, the A2s, we had the Pariah pickups, the Rewind, the, of course, the 78. The custom custom was was great for the hotter thing because now when we get into the A2s, we can talk about the nine Ks as well as the fourteen Ks and what that gives you. You know, how did you feel yeah. about that? Like, the I mean, to be honest, I, I don't really care for the the hotter wine, um, the hotter wine A2s generally. What about I mean, the custom custom? Because you have that in. Your, oh your yeah, I don't like it that much. I mean, it's okay. Mm -hmm. it's not my favorite. Um, I mean, I think the 9K A2, the, the Pasadena White, I think that was from Pariah, yeah. to me was probably one of the best for that guitar that you used. Okay. But, you know, here's the, th here's the thing that I really want to put out there for people. is just because we say that pickup is the best for, you know, that guitar doesn't mean one of the other pickups isn't better for your guitar. Or your, amp. your guitar is your guitar basswood is your guitar alder is your guitar a les paul is your yeah. guitar so or your amp like the second degree black belt in a les paul is awesome mm -hmm. i mean jerry cantrell uses that in his les pauls yeah um, i know, could Steve hear that means has it in a few guitars because sure. it's a super percussive pickup and, and the you know the mahogany with that big fat thing uh it, it just really cuts it's like a real percussive thing yeah i mean a rosewood fingerboard with yeah. a mahogany body or a, you know i could see it being uh depending on what you want it's all once again it's all the formula it's all the recipe you know but also, but, but but the second degree black belt and i have a, a black uh road worn strat with a traditional fender bridge which is real traditional van halen old uh you know with a maple neck and in that particular guitar sounds like van halen too Mm hmm yeah 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 so, so i don't okay. know you know you know here's the thing it's like uh, i recently had someone that said i have this maple guitar this old maple guitar kramer it was an old kramer or something and mm -hmm. i've tried every pickup and i don't know it's just they, they all seem it's kind of hard sounding you know 
Yeah, yeah. And, and they all seem, I don't know, I don't like them really. I tried everything. And I go, hey, try the Pasadena White from Pariah with the A2 magnet. In it. Mm -hmm. And I think you might like it with the hard wood. Yeah. And he loved it. You know, so, so you know, and then, then again, yeah. what? I got to hand it to those there's guys. There's so much to it. If you have a tone pot on your guitar, well, if that's hooked up, guess what? That changes everything also. Yeah, that's something. Do you have, um, you know, is it a 250K? Is it 500K? What body would? So there's no real answer on what the best pickup is, I hate to say. Yeah. I, had, I got to hand it to those. Generally, for the Ed thing, the flavor was the real hot thing from Van Halen 1 yeah. kind of deal, which was the distortion or the original Mighty Might. And then really just the A2... Nine came wide, I think. I mean, that's yeah. really all that. Choose your pick your flavor yeah. of the A2. And the no. funny thing is, in the end, the 59 sounded really cool, although a little bright. Yeah. Oh, so I was just going to say, like, I got to I got to hand it to the Pasadena White too, because I've had a couple friends that have bought that were like, that was the one I picked watching the video and just overall. And um, like a one friend of mine said, this is a pickup I've been looking for for 20 years. He got one, put it in his guitar. And, uh, no, I I do have sitting in a box at the shop, and I haven't put it in the guitar yet. Yeah, I do have a second degree black belt with an A2. Well, there you go. That's gonna yeah. So what's Let's that? Gonna that. Be? I really yeah. want to hear that. Well, and I enjoyed our the Sir the prototype, which was just it was just a little bit of an underwind because it was a regular Thornbucker, but we put the A2 in it, and the tone was like I was like great, and so you know. I'm messing with this stuff too. With uh, you know, but, you know, let's just talk. Needed to be a little bit hotter for the Van Halen thing in particular, you know. So let's talk pickups in general here. You know, the the thing is, is it's like it depends on what you're going for, you know. And yeah, and I always say this, and someone got someone got upset with us on on um, tone talk. Not upset. He goes, "You always say it depends on what you know. It depends. It depends." And I'm like, I when I'm answering a question to someone and they're giving me some information, mm -hmm. you know, what's the best phaser? Well, it depends. What sort of music are you going for? What sort of style are you going for? What right. sort of yeah? Because I can't definitively answer what's the best phaser because I could pick out six of them that I love. Yeah. But they're all different and across the map and they all do different things. Yeah. So like, you know, if if you're if you want to be Eddie Van Halen while well, the phase 90, you know, if you if you if you're going for, you know, the sound of a phaser on a cure record. Right. Well, that that's probably a boss phaser, you know, something. Right. You know. Mallstone is a great thing. Well, so, you know, it's like and they say that's bad. You know, he's like the the guy is like I wish you wouldn't say that all the time, you know, and I'm like but that it depends. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you what. For your for your friend, if he's watching this, I will, or the guy that was watching it, uh, I will say, I gotta say, the most versatile phaser I've tried in a long time. That what's the best? Well, we'll define best. It nailed vintage phase ninety, but it does a lot of other things too. Is the Seymour Duncan analog phaser they have? Really? The name of it, but it's amazing. The Seymour Duncan phaser oh, wow. you can do you can do four, eight, twelve stage, like all the different stages, and it's oh, got a lot. Okay, of so what they did is they took they made it kind of like uh, all the different phase nineties sort of. Well, not phase nineties, but probably like phase forty five, phase ninety, phase one hundred. You know, like the multiple. yeah. But it's gooey sounding, like an old phase, like it nails yeah. phase ninety. And I was like, wow, it really does that, but it does all this other shit too. And it is a really, really great phaser. So uh, that Seymour cool. Duncan analog phaser is really, it's really terrific. I think. Yeah, I mean, I always felt the funny thing is, I always felt that even though like uh, Dunlop reissued uh, phasers, uh, like a seventy four script hand wired, yeah, that they reissued. They reissued it, sort of. I mean, it, it is the original circuit and everything about it is original, except they use metal film resistors and mm. and I've all and the originals used all carbon comp resistors, mm -hmm. which probably for Dunlop is not really an option. Um, right. But the old one is uh, compared directly; it's like basically the same sound, but. If you've had old ones, there's a gooiness <laughs> to yeah. it. 
And it, it's it, it's it's That's almost true. like the difference between like say a CD and 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 an actual vinyl record, yeah. the same yeah. song. There's sure. this gooiness of the vinyl. Soupy. And the CD sounds basically the same, but it's lacking a little dimension and and, and feel to it. It's it's interesting. Yeah, when you play a vintage phase 90, there is that thing. That's it's just like, oh, it's it almost like when you smack it, it almost compresses a little bit. Yeah. It, yeah. You use oh, different yeah. resistors or whatever, the carbon comps or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I really don't I haven't tested that theory. I don't know if that's a thing, but that seems to be the mm -hmm. only thing that's different. So I would think that maybe that would be the thing. John is just saying back to pickups for a second. Um, John is saying, so fair warning went to 14k A2. We don't know for sure, but it sure sounds kind of like it. Uh yeah. Maybe or JB, maybe right? It might have been a JB, which which isn't an A2, probably. So, yeah, but right well, around then he was going to the custom, custom, fucking around with you know, trying that stuff, and you know, uh, JB, custom, custom, you know, showed up in the me, fair warning almost sounds like a JB to me, honest. Yeah, I agree. I, I, we, that's something we have never experimented with. We should probably do that too. Yeah. I mean, what you happens know, you shove a JB in the, you know, that black guitar? <laughs> worked for Warren D. Martini, you know. Oh yeah, big time. Uh, I will say I did like the custom custom in the uh, in the, in the shootout we did. I thought the custom custom was like that's a good sound. Like if you go back and listen to it, it's like oh that's pretty cool, you know. For, there was a lot of great flavors. It's just like pick your. So what I was coming, I was I was mentioning because you know I've been playing this stuff a lot lately. Playing this guitar, this guitar with this pickup in it. Because there's one thing about this, you know, it's like, okay, there's the sound, which is the most that sounds like the sound when you record it and listen back or whatever. But then there's just like, what just works when you're playing and it feels good? And especially for playing live, what has the the thing that's, e you know, the ease of play and like the, and I got to say that this, which is kind of, how different really is the EVH pickup to a custom custom or to the Frankenstein? I mean, they're both 14K A2. The spec is close, you no. know? It's it, but not to me, it's not like worlds apart from the custom custom, not as different as say an A5 low wind would be to you know what I mean? The the the, the 14k A2 hot kind of like you know, bit, whether it's the Pasadena Black, the uh custom custom, the Frankenstein pickup, they're, 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 we're talking about different shades of a really similar kind of which is a hotter pushing the amp rolled off on the top end kind yeah. of thing, you know, that is like. And and I gotta say that I, I do get why that's kind of where he ended up and why it's popular is because it's just kind of easy. It's easier to play and stuff, you know. Now, I think my favorite's still the nine K versions, but I do get why people like the slightly hotter and it's just you know, I remember Seymour Duncan used to say in his ad, he used to say, uh, you know, hotter wine for live playing, something like that. In like the Seymour Duncan pickup ads in the 80s, he'd be like, it's got the, the drive that you need for live performance or something. And it'd be like, that's just kind of marketing. But I, in a way, I was like, oh, it's a little hotter, so it feels a little better and a little easier to play when, when you're on stage in the, the kind of the heat of the whatever, you know, and you don't want him to work as hard. Because I think that's where Eddie ended up. He didn't want to work as hard <laughs> as he had all those years, it, you know, which is why he ended up with Soldanos and Morgane and all that stuff, and we could go down that road, but we don't have to. But there is something about the the push of a slightly hotter pickup and all that. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, I think most of the pickups in the shootout were good pickups. And I don't think that they would not work in some guitar. Right, right, right. Again, I have to preface, you know, you, you, it depends on your guitar. It just because yeah. we like this one does not mean it's going to work in your guitar. And your amp. Yeah, and your amp. So so you, you need to experiment some. Yeah. Yeah, if you want Eddie Van Halen, actually, uh, early Eddie Van Halen, but you're using a more modern amplifier that's maybe a little warmer and gainier, and you go to an A2 hot pickup, I think that all might be a little too much. Too mushy and too, yeah. Like yeah, maybe an A5, right. maybe a, a, the the uh, second degree black belt or the VH2 yeah. from Bare Knuckle in a guitar, like especially if you've got a bass a basswood guitar or something in a hotter, like let's say one of the new EVH amps. Yeah. Or, or maybe yeah, you don't want you don't want more front end. If you got a hot amp, you don't want you really don't want front end gain. I agree. Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking. We were talking on Tone Talk the other night. Dean DeLeo was on. 
Yeah, and, which was uh, great, by the way. That was awesome. Yeah, and, and it's funny. We were talking. Uh, well, Dean doesn't know exactly how it's in some of his guitars, so I, I texted his guitar tech, you know, what pickups and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you know, his original 78 Les Paul is just the original pickups that came with it. So that would have been a T-top kind of kind of pickup um, or some era of a T-top, 7.6K. Well, it's a standard? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. T-tops were around 7.5, 7.6. Okay. Yeah, they're really and, low and wide. Five generally. Yeah, uh, they're kind of bright and cutting, and um, yeah. and so and so the guitar tech answer he goes in some of the Les Pauls. We found the the we put Duncan jazz pickups in. I go really, and he goes yeah because it's it's El Nico five and about seven point six k. It's actually the closest spec of Duncan to that T top. Makes a lot of sense for Dean. Oh, okay. Because he always <laughs> gravitated later towards single coils. I mean, he was playing the special with P90s, and that makes sense that he would like that. You know, that the hot pickups didn't jive with his. You know, actually, Alex has a, a super chat question here, and this is this is a good question. What are the general differences in tone and feel between using a hotter pickup or a boost, hotter pickup or a boost in front of a flexi style amp, versus increasing preamp gain in a more modern high gain amp? Oh boy. Um, uh, I'll tell you what. I think that the that in a vintage amp, um, you're pushing the entire amp, right? Whereas if you're yeah. just bringing up the preamp gain in a modern amp, you're pushing the you're 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 overdriving a cascaded preamp. That's the difference. Right. When you push the whole thing, including the speakers and the preamp and the power amp and everything, you end up with that slightly more. Je ne sais quoi, uh, you know, like that blowing up plexi sound more than just that preamp gain thing, which is what we get with later Van Halen and stuff. It's a different sound, you know. I mean, that, 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 and that's so, you know, if you're boosting, well, I guess a pickup and a boost is very, you know, the heat of a pickup versus a boost is very similar. Except, it, 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 wait, but what I mean by a boost, like say it's a clean boost. Yeah. It's very similar. And even a clean boost that has like say a mid bump or a mid range boost. Yeah. All that can be done in a pickup also. But don't you feel uh, when you when you get a hotter pickup, you're gonna change that resonant peak. There's kind of a you, the more Well yeah, that's that's the filter. But 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 people essentially are doing that because like for instance, all the people that all the kind of metal guys that like the tube screamer uh, with no gain, pretty much, it's just boosted with the tone knob set at a certain spot. Mm -hmm. You're changing the resonant. You're basically sort of changing where the resonant peak is. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a filter. It's a boost, but it's also a filter. And it's filtering out some low end and boosting a little mids, like in that particular thing. Um, so it, it, it's similar. Depends on how the pickups wound and how what that's going to sound like. It's very similar to a clean boost or a semi-clean boost. Um, if you're using something that has uh, clipping diodes or something in it that are actually clipping, then that's different. Right. You know. Uh, Let me grab a couple super chats here. Well, yeah, sure. before they disappear from the uh, Jeff says. Uh, I don't know about my Wolfgang from my fifty-one fifty-three EL thirty-four. 50 watt head is not mushy at all. It's an amazing tone. Um, what do you feel about that? Of course, it depends how you dial your amp and stuff. But, you know, that red channel. I don't know, man. For me, the 50. Okay, wait, 51, 53, 50 watt. Okay, so for me, that 50 watt head has about five times too much gain. Uh, the red channel on that amp, which is probably what, if Ed was using a 50 watt amp, is probably what he would use. Uh huh. Uh, I I literally have to set the gain at two on the red, yeah, to get something I like. Like there's no there's no whip fiddle room there. It's like yeah, on one maybe two and and any more. It's just like holy crap. It's a lot of gain. I don't, I used to need, use I don't the... think you need any more hot from a pickup. <laughs> That's right. There's enough gain in the amp. To... I used yeah, to use. I think it sounds better with like a seven point six k pickup. Yeah, I I agree. I used to. Use I mean, I like that amp. Don't get me wrong. I think it sounds pretty good. I I used to use the blue channel, you know, because I toured with the original one. wasn't the I know that changed. Yeah, but that's not the, the fifty watts different. So later, 
the blue channel on the original 5150M was reasonably lower gain, meaning you can get the gain up pretty high. You know, like you could get it up. It, it I mean, even if you yeah. put it on 10, it wasn't like over the top gain. Right. It was like a kind of a blown up plexi kind of tone. Yeah. And, but later, he had another gain stage to that channel. Uh, to the blue and channel? To the blue channel. Oh, did he? In later version. Yeah. Another gain stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Okay. Which you'd have to turn the gain down to like four to get what it was at 10. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it kind of out of control, I think. <laughs> I mean, I used the original one in that How to Play Eruption video. I original did, one? Was, uh, the original one on that blue channel was great. I thought that was, the blue that channel was, was really good. Very similar to, you know, the funny thing is if you A-B the original one to, like, say, my BE channel, very similar. Yeah. Very, very similar in, in characteristics, sound, and everything. Yeah, I, I quite liked it. I remember the first time I ran into, you know, Guitar Center and I was getting something, I saw that amp, I thought, oh, I want to try one of those, the new 5150, and I plugged in, and I was like, blue channel playing, I was like, damn, this sounds amazing, like, just at a nice yeah. low volume, it actually sounded really good on that channel, and that became, I bought one, and I used it for the next year on tour with, with Chris, that was my main kind of dirty rhythm tone, and yeah. then I, you know, hit it for the boost and stuff. But I rarely use the red channel, I'll say that. Plexico's in then Super Chat, and he says, "Any? can you walk next door and both be on the same camera? We're in different locations. Yes, I'm at my house. <laughs> Blair's up there as, as well, and he says, have you played or modded a trainer YBA1A? You have one, don't you? I have one, and uh, yes. Which um, I you can make it a JTM45, sure. Uh, well, under blackface basement, it's very different. You, you can easily, much more easily make it a JTM 45. Interesting. Much easier to make it, sorry. A, uh, a JTM 45. It's base. basically, the signal path of the trainer is basically a marshal. Hmm. It's basically a basement slash marshal. You know, not the blackface basement. That's a totally different circuit. Got it. Hollywood Actor says... Talking about pick up pickups and matching it to the guitar, which is more important, matching to the guitar or matching to the amp? I think it all matters. Everything matters. Yeah. Speaker, speakers, pickup, guitar, amp. That's your rig. Well, whatever amp you're playing is what you're going to use to figure out what pickup you like in the guitar, right? Right. <laughs> so you're kind of starting with the amp. Okay, here's the amp I like. And then you're matching the pickup to the guitar into that amp. Yeah. I mean, that's at least how I would do it. Yeah, I mean, it seems like guitar, amp, you know, you kind of get your thing and then you like start going like, okay, I basically like my sound, but I wish it had a little bit more of this or that. And that's when you start changing pickups, you know, like, you know, if, you, if you're basically happy with your the amp is really important, so important, you know, and, and then the, the guitar is obviously important, but your, your guitar should be ballpark. And then you're just like, yeah, I like it. But when I go to the neck pickup on my Les Paul, it's a little too wooly. Well, that you can fix with a pickup swap you know yeah. generally. but uh you know it's it's important to get the the rig squared away basically b before you start changing pickups hoping that it's going to change your entire sound it's not you know speakers and amp are actually i think the two biggest thing even over the guitar you know it's it's uh uh jeff says uh gain is at 1.5 for the red channel <laughs> <laughs> well there you go yep. yeah that'll work and uh, blue channel exclusively set at five. Well, that's pretty low game. That'll yeah. We're talking about you know, yeah, yeah. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just not the boost guy. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I think boost serves a purpose, but I'm not an always on boost guy. No, no. I mean, a boost serves a purpose for a lead sound or something, or or like some sort of filtered tone, like you're trying to go for a certain sound with 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 it, changing the tone, you know. But so, I'm gonna get it out of the amp guy. Absolutely. Yeah, you you well, I mean, when you're working on amps or when we're you know messing around with stuff, you're like, let me just cut the bass with this cap a bit in the front end and do it. You do it in the amp, right? Yeah. Okay. That's your that's your gig. You know, a, a pedal is always to me, and it originally was too, all those who get some great tones. I mean, Brian May with the range master in front of a normal channel on AC30, which was a big fat band-aid that just happened to work beautifully. You that know? was an English thing. 
It's like it's a total English thing, you know, like so because because like the range master Trevor maybe a Rory Gallagher thing. Let's give it let's give the Irish. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but but um but it was it was an English thing, you know. It was yeah. uh you know, it's like uh uh, all those bands back then, uh, Priest. You know, Judas Priest. Yeah, it's a treble booster into a, an old Sabbath. Bar, you know, Sabbath, everything. Yeah, it's, yeah. It was, that was the thing to do. Here's the Marshall. Here's the, the treble booster. Yeah, to push it. Yeah, that's a great sound, you know. But yeah. but but band aidy. And then later on, it's like people didn't, you know, you didn't do that as much when we got to Eddie Van Halen or Angus Young or whatever because Marshall just started to, you know, obviously. Uh, well, here's a question to, to uh, segue into that. Did you like 78 GMP 100 or 50 watt amps? I know what you're going to say. No. <laughs> well, but easily okay. capable. Easily. I capable. mean, well, okay. So a 78 GMP 100 master volume, first of all, um, or 50 watt. That the 50 watts of that era kind of sucked because they had um, a low voltage power transformer. Mm-hmm. So like 380 volts on the plates, really, really low. You can make them sound good, but in general, not the great greatest. The 100 watts weren't like that. That, that was They were cool. Uh, it's cool. That's interesting info. But, yeah, in fact, most of the 50 watts from even, say, like 75-ish, Till the 800 series had low voltage power transformers. You you can make them sound good, but you got to do something. You got to boost. You have to boost the preamp voltages on the on the preamp section, phase inverter section, and preamp section, so they match what what a old like an older amp would be. Interesting. And if you do that, then they sound cool. But they're lower volume. They're not as loud. Um, Maybe that could be good. For a maybe lot of a little softer in nature and, and thing, but um, but the hundreds have the. Here's yeah, the thing. I mean, the the, the 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 master volume, and I think Pete will agree. Uh, you know, it has a sound. It's it's cool, but it's a little floppy in the low end, yeah. which is why people tended to use boosts with them. Um, you tend when you when you turn one on, you tend to turn the low end kind of low. The mid's kind of high. The presence in trouble somewhere around noonish or something. And the gain it has a bright cap on the gain. Really, you gotta run it around six or seven because you need that cut that the bright cap adds to make it a little little tighter. Can't Turned run that when you turn it really up. Floppy. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can fix that. You can change one cap in the amp, and it fixes a lot of that. Yeah. Um, there's a couple other things you can do, but uh, but if you're gonna crank the amp, it can sound pretty cool. Uh, if if you're gonna crank it, like meaning like to eight or ten on the master, and uh, and then just the preamp around six, treble at eight presence at eight mid at like six ish bass kind of low two three if you're going to do that then it sounds pretty great <laughs> of course you're going to need an attenuator it's so interesting that we we were playing around with that a little bit recently and i i just never really realized that that uh that crazy thing that happens when you get the master up high on those amps and all of a sudden it alleviates that weird Futsy low end that they can have the flubby thing. I would have thought it would be the opposite, but there's whatever happens when you open it up and it just then it roars and it's adding gain and brightness to it as you're distorting the power section. Yeah, um, and and it starts roaring at around six and then just goes a little more and more and more to ten. But do you think it uh, like the preamp? Maybe ten's not good. Like it's just a, like a little. No, no, bit. you can't do the preamp at ten. You still need that that preamp. Literally, when you're running it like that, yeah, you kind of use the master as your gain. Right. <laughs> so if you wanted a little less gainy, you just back the master off a little bit to like eight, seven. Right. Um, so maybe the best sound is both at seven. <laughs> oh, did you freeze? Dave froze. So let's just 
let's just assume that that's what he was saying. <laughs> uh, what do we got here until Dave comes back? And hopefully I'm still working. I'm working, right? Somebody let me know that the uh, stream's still working. Uh, we didn't completely drop out here. Uh, staring contest. Am I working? You're good, says Amanda. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to take one of these super chats then while we wait for Dave. Uh, uh, keeping it EVH centric, that Headrush MX5 is very intriguing to me. Does it EVH? Um, you know, the original, one of the things in the in the Headrush was the original Plexi. If, if you were a fan of those units, a lot of people would talk about how the Marshall was really good, the, the, the Plexi. And I would agree that it was a cool sound. So yeah, you can kind of get there. Um, and there's a lot of players that, that get, I mean, like Tracy Guns is a big Head Rush fan, and Neely uh, Brosh also, who was in a Van Halen tribute kind of cover thing uh, for a bit. I'm not sure if she was using the Head Rush for the the tone in that, but anyways, they were both sort of EVH heads, and and uh, and they get great kind of you know dirty modded Marshall tones out of out of their Head Rush. So I would say so. I mean, you could get you could get pretty close, you know, um, but I think you can get, you know. As close as you could, you, you know, without going all the way and doing all the stuff, you know, I think with an Axe Effects, you can get fairly close. I think with the Helix, you can get fairly close. I think with the, you know, you just got to use the right combination of stuff. I mean, I have an EVH kind of preset on my Helix, and I use the Placator, which is like Dave's BE uh, uh, model, you know, that's in the Helix, and a Greenback IR from Celestion, and it sounds Sounds great. I think Dave's back. Hey. Hey, you froze there. Ah, the internet just dropped out for no reason. Spectrum. Love him. Love him. Uh, well, the weird thing is like, my computer just dropped it out for some reason. Oh, well, that's the mystery of mystery. Well, of anyway, what, what I was saying is essentially that 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 on that JMP cranked. Yeah. You have to have the gain pulled back a little bit because you need what that does, that bright cap across the volume, you need that kind of cut. Well, you're so really when, it's, when it's cranked, I just did one for someone else. And when it's cranked, you can really only use that between like six and seven. Right. I almost like should take the knob off and just fix it like to that <laughs> exact setting. But at that point, you've almost got a plexi with an extra gain stage. Well, you do. That's technically <laughs> what you're getting. You have a, a, a plexi with an extra gain stage that is adding a little bit of gain. Yeah. 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 And that's why we like it. Explain for folks just what is the reason that the preamp gain at six or seven or seven and a half works, but when you get up higher, it doesn't, is because you're letting that high end through and essentially you're attenuating the rest of the frequencies of the amp. Correct. Correct. That is what's that's what's happening. There's a bright cap. Like uh, if you've ever had a, a, just a bright cap in your guitar and you you know you roll it off and it's just a cap. It's not like a resistor in a cap. You you roll it off. You know that it it like just lets depending on the value of the cap, just the bright through and like it can't get really thin. So like if you roll it lower than five, it's like yeah, no, that sounds bad. <laughs> You gotta have six to seven. I, I just did this with some amp, and literally, like, there was no play other than six to seven. One trick pony. Mm -hmm. One trick pony. But if you want less gain, it's really cool. Though you just turn the master down a little bit, and then it just cleans up just a hair, and then you turn it down a little bit more, cleans up more. Yeah, and uh, it works really well actually. Uh, all righty, Andrew, there in the super chat, got on the list for Wildwood Twenty this week. What's different with your Wildwood 20 over a Okay, well, I originally started uh, with a, a Wildwood Pink Taco amp, uh, which had a, a saturation switch and a fat switch. And then they wanted something different and a little more full-fledged. Mm -hmm. So uh, essentially that amp has a clean channel, has a cab emulation, has... Um, um, the, it has the sad, it has the fat, it has a voice switch, which kind of tailors the top end a little bit. It has a way to get lower gain. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you can cut 
the the gain on it, so it gets more of say an eight eight hundred ish area area of gain. Hmm. Um, but it's still voiced kind of on the darker side, like the pink taco is. Okay. So pretty cool. Uh, also, he's asking, uh, do we prefer the Mobius or the MV500? Both are nice units. I have the Mobius on my board, and I'm very happy with it, and I have no desire to change it. But you I'm, mean the MD500? Yeah, the boss, right? Um, I'll, 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 I mean, the Mobius is a great unit. I actually prefer the boss. but um, You're a boss fan in general, though. Well, there's just some things in the boss that I don't feel the Mobius do, do that mm -hmm. well. I, I think... In general, I think the Mobius, or sorry, the boss um, does a wide variety of very popular chorus things, you know, like, so if you want that C1 tone, you can get a really, really good version of it. If you want the CE2 tone, which is very famous, get a really good version of it. Trems are good in it. Their Univibe sounds really strong, I think. I think that... Sounds better than the Mobius Univibe, personally. Um, I'd have to try it. I don't know. I like the Mobius Univibe a lot, though. So. Uh, uh, but the Mobius is a good piece too. So uh, I, I don't know. Oh, but there's you know there's other stuff it does too pretty well. The M MD does a, a pitch detune really well. Hmm. Um, so if you wanted to go for that on a sound, I think they're both really good. Yeah, it's hard to go wrong. These are both. It's like it's like do you want the Lexus or the Infinity or whatever, right? It's like these yeah. are both good. I think you need to just look at the look at the parameters and and look at the the effects that are in it and decide yeah. what effects do you need. You know. Yeah, yeah. Here's a good question: um, What's the difference between loading and attenuating and reactive loading? I mean, I always say with attenuating, you're sucking some of the juice off the amp and still sending through to the speaker. Yeah. With you know, with this thing, it's essentially like a thing that's you know, it's a network of stuff, resistors and stuff that's sucking some of the power, but still sending some through to the speaker. Whereas with loading, you're taking the whole thing and loading it all the way down to line level, and then now if you want to play through a speaker, you need to reamp, but with another power amp or something to get the signal back up to where we can hear it. So that's the difference: is that with one of them, you're still passing some signal through to the speaker. With um, reactive loading, you're doing it in such a way that the amplifier still responds exactly like it's plugged into a speaker, which with a typical resistive load, it doesn't. It's a different, it's a different sound, <coughs> and um, both can work, but the reactive load feels more familiar to what we're used to plugged into a cab, feels and sounds more. And I always say that loading the amp down and then reamping as the power station does so well and stuff is an easier way to keep to preserve your tone and just seems to work better than just about any passive attenuator i've tried the sucking some juice off the amp and still sending some through to the speaker method <laughs> correct and, and and you have an effects loop with the power station yeah which is a lot of advantages yeah. far superior you know which is really cool and you so, can get louder you know like if you go to five yeah, one you can take a champ yeah, and make it and make it and make it a hundred watts or ninety watts or whatever it is. And we're talking about units that are around the same price as a comparable. Like if we're talking about a power station compared to say you know the Iron Man, which is a really good passive attenuator, it does a good job. But they're around. The, we're talking about around the same dough, like in the same vicinity. Um, but you know, you just you can't do the effect loop and all the other stuff with the other. You know, I think they're good. Channel but, switching, channel switching levels on the PS one hundred. So right. you have you have the level channel switching. You can take the effects loop in and out with a foot switch. You know, no brainer. PS one hundred, baby. It's a great. It's just does a great job. That, that uh, you know, it's it's a terrific unit. Leon says, "I have a V one Dirty Shirley and love it. Works well with the guitar volume. What were you doing? What were you going for when you designed it? A V one Dirty Shirley. So does that mean an amp? The it means an early Dirty Shirley." Early Dirty Shirley head, I'm assuming, is what he means. Because uh, we do make up Dirty Shirley pedal. and <laughs> Sure. There's no V1. It's never really changed. So um, uh, what was I going for? I was going for kind of a JTM 45 super fat 
but with a little more control over the gain that you could use in a lower volume, essentially. That, that's what I was shooting for, and that's essentially what it does. Classic rock kind of thing, old vintage JTM 45 you thing. It does it really well. Um, there's a fellow that's asking about intonating the um, EVH guitar, and I'm just looking here and seeing how close the intonation is on mine because he's saying, Do you, did you intonate it? I actually can't remember, but I think I did when I got it. I must have, because I would have. Um, and mine looks dead nuts on right now, so I probably did do it. But yeah, I, I tend to intonate all my guitars, generally speaking. And then I get a little lazy about it and don't. I'm just checking it right now. And it, it, uh, yeah, it's rock solid, the intonation on this guitar, actually. And, and I don't know if everyone knows this, but like, if you're intonating a guitar, yeah. Uh, in what manner do you play it the most? Is it standing up? Is it sitting down? Uh, because this will all have a factor on your intonation. Like so, maybe don't do it like this on a bench. Oh yeah, yeah. You don't you don't do it tipped back. However, you're go actually however you're going to actually play the guitar. Yeah. The majority of the time is the best way to do it can be kind of a pain in the ass, but it, it is the best way to do it. But I was, it, even if you just hold the guitar in your lap and if you lean forward with the guitar a little bit or lean back a little bit, it's going to change the result of this intonation. 100%. <laughs> so uh, that, that goes for two. So the question is, that, and, and I remember a long time ago, um, uh, do you remember Walter that used to work for me? Sure. So uh, uh, Walter, a lot of times would work in, with people in the studio over the years, you know, as, as a sort of a tech for the studio and uh, people recording records and stuff. And a lot of times to, because of tuning problems and stuff, it had to do with how the person was fretting the guitar and holding sure. and how hard he was pulling on the strings and yeah. everything. So sometimes he would try to intonate the guitar with them actually doing the, you know, holding down of the string and everything. Sure. So it would be really tailored to them. It's very hard to do. <laughs> Every guitar tech I ever had on tour, there was always a bit of a training process where it was yeah. like, let me work with you for a few minutes here on how I hold the guitar and how I, and then when you tune, because I would have people that would tune the guitar flat you know, lying down and tune, and then they hand. Oh it fuck no! Yeah, and it's like, no, you can't do that. You have to actually put it on the strap, and and then you have to kind of attack it about as hard as I do. So I would show them like yeah. I hit the string like this, and I like it on the low yeah. strings to go a little sharp, and then go into tune, and then maybe yeah. fall off flat. Especially on a Les Paul, it's like oh, yeah. you know. And then also like on a Les Paul, to hold down the second or third fret on the B string and tune to that because it always seems if you do that, then the open note's a little flat. And that's just like some of the weird idiosyncratic things with guitars. And But yeah, there's always a moment of training with a tech. And then the ones that could do all that stuff. I remember when I was playing with Cornell. I still feel bad about this. So I had that one tech out that, that you mentioned. I had to let him go. And you mentioned that guy wasn't very happy with me. <laughs> I remember that. And I still Tim? feel bad. Huh? Tim. I don't remember um, his name. Yeah. And, and it was it was 14 years ago. But um, yeah. but But I feel he was only there for a few days and, and I, I, it wasn't working and I, I just felt really, I still feel bad about it. And, you know, they were talking. Well, about I mean, you know, it, 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 it's an interesting thing. You know, the funny thing is when you, when you're a guitar tech too, uh, cause I've gone on the road with, you know, fill in things with the offspring and different things. And yeah, the worst part is when, when you're, you know, cause as a guitar tech, it, it, it's your job to get the guitars in tune and you're in generally the most, adverse possible conditions <laughs> like i remember sitting there tuning guitars at the um at, in japan at um summer sonic festival on, Osaka, on an outdoor stage facing the water and it, yeah. it was it was a hundred degrees at least maybe 110 degrees out yeah, yeah. humid is all could be yeah and, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there, you know, you're standing at the guitar station, you're tuning the guitar because you want to do it standing. And I'm sitting there tuning the guitar and 
sweat is dripping off my face onto the guitar, you know, like just <laughs> everywhere, you know. And at that moment, I go, now I understand what sweat bands are for. <laughs> you know, I totally get it because, like, you know, it would catch it in your forehead, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and like, and I go, if I had one right now, I'd just rock it. <laughs> yeah. Full seven. <70s. laughs> stupid as fuck, but I'd rock it. That'd be cool. You know? But yeah. um, and same thing with the wrist, you know, the sweat bands on the wrist too, because literally I'm just dripping water on the guitar because it's just so fucking hot. And yeah, how, yeah. you know, how are you supposed to keep these guitars in tune in that humidity and stuff too? It's just like changes. I was constantly tuning the guitars. You'd be done. It's perfect. You come back to it ten minutes later. Yeah, it's it's off again. You know, Try, and, and, trying to and, tune acoustics is a whole nother like stretch. Stretch, stretch, yeah. stretch, because you had to, especially with them. Uh, and you know, stretch and pull and use the trim and yank the string again, you know, to try to make sure it's yeah. all in tune. Yep. And then the funny thing is, you know, it's in tune, and then you give it to the guitar player, and it sounds completely out of tune because he's <laughs> yanking on the strings <laughs> in a poor manner that just sounds out of tune. You're just like, fuck, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> But he doesn't look back at you weird. He's fine. <laughs> then you're golden. It's I'm a like, hard, okay. As long as you're not getting job. the evil eye. Yeah, as long as you don't get the evil eye, which I've gotten and given. But <laughs> yeah, I just, I still feel bad. But it just, I was getting, long story short, I was getting guitars that were out of tune. And Cornell liked to go song to song to song many times fast. And it would be like, I'd put it on and be like, holy shit. And then, and I played a lot of Left Falls in my yeah. SG, and there were hard guitars to tune on that tour. And it was like, I just needed somebody, and that's when we called Dave Burnson, and he came out. Mm -hmm. And it was like, mm -hmm. I mean, the difference of the first show was just like, so these are things that happen. But anyway, John's there in the super chat, and he says, my two favorite dudes, and he's just wondering uh, about lead time on a BE-412. Should he order one now? How's your cabinet production? Uh, I haven't seen any cabinets yet. <laughs> <laughs> so... um. We might be a little ways out, Jeff. Maybe wait for a minute. Maybe Give it a wait moment. for a minute, yeah. Um, thank you, John. And Matthew says, the Celestian Gold just died in my 112 port city. That's interesting. So I'm in the market for a replacement. I use the Ox and love the Greenback Punch Cab. What should I look for to get close? You like the Redback for a kind of Greenbacky high power thing, right? I think the Redback sounds really good. Um... It has a nice, it, it, it's, it sounds very greenbacky, but maybe it has a little more rolled off in the top end, which often, especially with brighter amps, kind of works. Mm -hmm. And especially like, uh, I mean, how it's going to sound in that cab, I'm not sure. Um, but it will handle it. The unfortunate thing is like uh, the reason we switched to redbacks in our combos because the cream back just isn't enough power and would not hold up, especially with a open back cabinet where there is no back pressure. Mm. So the speaker's just flopping in the wind and they would blow them up, especially if people played it loud. I think Richie Sambora blew up three of them. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, but he's playing it loud. I mean, if you're playing in a one, you're going to be good forever. But right. I, I've had them blow up in our combos more, more, more times than I care to, you know, deal with. Yeah. I know T uh, Toshi's blown, uh, our friend Toshi has blown up uh, all sorts of speakers in his Bucks and Betty amp. <laughs> <laughs> I think finally I might have put that in. <laughs> For the Redback? Yeah, I think so. I think that's 150 last. watts. And... I think that was the last speaker I put in, and he wound up liking it. So. Well, that's good. There you go. I, I think that's probably the best recommendation. Well, I mean, um, I really like the Creamback 75, too. It's uh, good. Which, well, I've seen that blown up, too. <laughs> So have you? Yeah. We haven't had that happen, but we generate in amps with two, you know. Um, yeah. You know, most of the cabs. My cabs have those. I've never blown one up, and I run them with my 100 watt. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it should, be, it should be fine, but uh, the open back cabs is where I had the problem. Uh, and I think the red back does sound cool. It does look really good, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're cool looking. I mean, I mean, I just looked at – we had one in a combo uh, yesterday, and uh, – and I'm looking at it and going, God, it does look good. <laughs> yeah. Something about that kind of, you know, blood red 
back, that lets us pitch it. Um, Steven's asking about from the pickup shootout, what would you guys choose for a 91? I think I had one of these guitars, Steven, the exact same one. Made in Japan, Strat, basswood body with a Floyd and Rosewood. I had that guitar. My, mine might have had a maple fingerboard, but it was Sunburst with a Floyd. And it was a cool guitar. Um, uh, ew, let me think about that. Um, in that, it, it kind of depends on, on what amp you're using, but I would say with a basswood body, it depends if the guitar now sounds. You know, like, yeah, it, it really depends on your, yeah, so, if you want the slightly brighter, you know, you yeah, could go. Oh, the second. Yeah. He's got 250K tone pots too. Right. Which is so standard. Roll it off even more top. End. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe in that guitar, maybe the VH2, the bare knuckle, or, or maybe the, the second degree black belt might work good, you know? Yeah. If you want. Well, that, that would be my guess. Yeah. yeah. One of those. I would say that would give you a pretty good. But if you feel like your tone's a little bright as it is right now, then don't be afraid to experiment with something like the Pasadena White or the 78, you know, um, the A2 jobbies. It just depends, you know. And those those pickups should balance better with the singles than one of the hotter 14K. I don't think I would go that hot. You know, when any guitar with single coils, to me, it's a always a balance of trying to get something that's not... You know, it's interesting, like the Jakey e. Lee... Uh, you know, uh, got where guys that use JBs, you know, Warren, uh, when they use a neck pickup, they use this quarter pounders or, or Jake would use the SDS one, you know, the hotter singles. And when I played Jake's guitar, it was interesting. I hit the neck pickup and I was like, oh, holy shit. Like these pickups do balance like almost perfectly with the, with the bridge pickup. And it's a real balanced output. So it, it, it's, inter it's interesting with Jake. He, he, there, he really like on his own personal guitar, he really thinks about things a little bit. Like, yeah. he like he liked, um, Bent metal saddles on the top three strings, but he liked block saddles on the bottom strings. Huh. So he he had it that way. And then also oh. in his in frets, uh, it was it was like sixty one hundred frets until it got to the high frets, and then it was sixty one hundred five frets. Yep. So because they were narrower, yeah, and you could kind of get between them better. Well, and it's a Gibson scale too, so that makes sense because it's yeah. Narrower. But even even earlier, like that, he'd done that for years. And, right. Uh, 12, 12 frets and up at sixty one hundred five, but everything below at sixty one hundred, and then yeah. they're obviously leveled to be the same. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. You know, it's really cool. Like, uh, uh, John, I experimented with saddles like that too. I mean, I tend to like bent metal saddles more than block saddles. Uh huh. And, uh, uh, but I've, I, I've done the same thing before I experimented on a guitar, you know, that, where it was like that. It was interesting. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with you. I like the bent metal styles too, but it's interesting when I started with the Wilkinson bridges kind of across the board, putting those Wilkinson lock saddles on my guitars or that bridge, yeah. it improves the tone of every guitar I put them on and they're kind of, a metal, but they're different. Well, it's like a totally different thing probably. Yeah. John says, um, I wish you wouldn't always say it depends. Well, it does depend, John. <laughs> it fucking depends, John. It depends on what your amp is and your guitar and everything. So it just depends. <laughs> I don't wear depends, at least not yet, but it depends. Uh, guitar Nerd says, do tube shields on a 12AX7 help with amp noise? We talked about this a little while ago. My Bogner Helios didn't come with any from the factory but it does get noisy as you turn up the game. Uh, my short answer, and I bet Dave would agree, is that it's that's probably not the problem, but 12AX7's no. shields do help with certain, um, occasionally when you get like crazy RF in a place and stuff, I run into, there's very few situations, but every now and then a tube yeah. shield helps, right? I kind of started using them, uh, most of the time, most of the amps we did ship without them, because uh, actually, uh, don't call me crazy, but I think it actually sounds better without them. Mm -hmm. But um, that's subjective. But uh, on some of the amps, I started just using the first stage or the first two stages with shields because that's where it really matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just because of RF that can bleed into the tube, like cell phone noise and different kinds of digital beeping noises and things like that. So that's where it comes into play. It could be possible that the Helios is just noisy. Yeah, and there's probably there's a really easy way to tell. Like if the amp's on and you think it's noisy, just kind of wrap your hand, just kind of cup your hand around the uh, 
around around the first tube and if oh. and you know sort of touch the chassis and if if that noise kind of goes away and gets better then it it would benefit a tube shield that's interesting yeah even if you have rf you can kind of cup your hand around it because you're sort sure. of round and, and, and you can you can touch you can touch the chassis with your thumb or something just kind of cup your hand around it and it you can hear the difference interesting yeah. i'm learning stuff i am learning stuff uh, a few questions here, like Cam says, did you like the, how do you like the Fishman Fluence? So I've been experimenting with those a little bit. I've tried three sets in this guitar I have now. Mainly what I was experimenting with was for noise. And I'll tell you what I've found is that the Fishman Modern Ceramic, the covered one that's completely enclosed, and it's the Modern Ceramic Humbucker, is pretty not much dead silent in my studio and has the best noise rejection of just about any pickup I've ever tried in here. The other ones, the open coil Fishman classic ones and stuff like that, I actually like the sound of better, but they're a little bit noisier. Still pretty good though for, for the noise. Cause I, I've mainly experimented with them more than the tone was, I was looking for a very quiet guitar for the studio. Um, the set that I have in there now, I went to the Keith Marrow set. Uh, that's the fellow, right? Um, did that? Did, did you try that? Did yeah. you say that? Did that work? Uh, they they sound quiet? good, but they're, they're once again a little bit noisier than that. That one dead silent one is that mm -hmm. uh, that the modern ceramic was, was dead quiet, but it was a little bit of a hammer when it comes to the tone. You know, it was just like a yeah. big loud ceramic full thing. You know, and I so I ended up going to this Keith Merrill set, and they're they're pretty good in that guitar, and I still have to play with it more. I haven't had enough chance to mess around with it a lot. Um, I've done, you know, you guys have seen the uh, the EMG loaded silver guitar, and actually this thing has become kind of a favorite of mine around here, um, which is just an '85 and SA SA set, the kind of the classic set, uh, and this guitar quite quiet, especially if I sit right this way with it. It's like I can get almost dead silent in my room here, which is what I wanted. I wanted one guitar that was just super quiet in this noisy building with there's a fair amount of EMI in the air or whatever. Uh, but, and I quite like the sound of them. And I've been sort of like thinking like, um, used to be like people were like, oh, I don't like EMGs or maybe the sound is too, you know, the active pickup thing, they're cold. I started thinking like, this doesn't feel that weird. Like I thought they were gonna be more different than they are. And what I realized is like, Maybe it's because I'm so used to playing, and we all are these days, like into pedal boards with buffers and stuff, you know? Like, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I use a 10-foot cable here in the room. It's not long, not a lot of capacitance, and I'm hitting my pedal board almost all the time or a splitter box, but it's usually my pedal board these days. And the first thing it hits is actually Dave's buffer in the... Uh, and, then, in and, then the goes, and then it goes through yet another buffer. A bunch of buffers. And, and, then, it, and then it goes into another buffer in the ampy. <laughs> Exactly. Like my crazy signal chain. You know, if you were a guy, I guess that was used to what I'm getting at is plugging into a Tweed Fender Deluxe or even like a Plexi or something with a 20 foot cable and your guitar and you had maybe a couple, you know, like Eddie, a phase 90 in line or whatever. And then, you know, that's a sound. And then if you go to an EMG guitar, that's going to be, oh, all of a sudden we're buffers very different, you know, but we've all been plugging into these boards that we've got now with these fancy buffers and stuff on them and stuff. And it's like, you know, and so I think that this maybe isn't that radical sounding, the difference. The good news also is if you wanted to stick a combo all the way up in my area yeah. and run a 100-foot cable, you can yeah. do it with that guitar. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's that, that was the thing originally was this, this was maybe people's first introduction to, like, buffers. and Oh, they're great for effects because you can run long, you know, it'll drive all your effects and all that. But now we've all got boards that do that anyway. So it's like, it's interesting. But, um, but it sure that it sounds good DI too. It's her, look at that color right there. When I hold it, like it's got, it looks almost like it's got some gold in the paint, you know, this guitar. And I, I just love the color of it. It's like, I'm totally down with this Inca silver thing. It's like badass looking. So I'm, I'm really stoked on this guitar. Actually, it's, it's a good tool, really good tool. It's fun. Totally different than my normal thing, but uh, but there you go. Uh, Dave, what do you think about this? Any difference between sound, Rivera Rock Crusher, and PS100? Well, I mean, I think in like if you're using kind of Marshall style amps, I think I think the Rock Crusher is actually pretty decent. 
of, of a thing. I, I, when we had another person in our building that had a studio, we did a little test about that and we recorded some clips and like listen back. And, and for, it pretty much sounded really good. I mean, it maybe it lopped a tiny bit of top end off, but it was good. I mean, the, overall, the PS100 is going to be more versatile and better. I mean, you have a loop, and you, you know, it's just just overall better. Um, but the, I mean, the Rock Crusher is a decent, decent attenuator. I thought quite good too. My 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 only problem with it was the, uh, to be honest, the first attenuation click was quite dramatic. Yeah. More than I might need a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Great if you're trying to get down to a really low volume, but um, it sounded like it's it's labeled as four dB or something. It sounds more like six or eight to me. Yeah. It sounds like the second click on a hot. But it, it does overall sound good. I mean, especially yeah. I know, especially with a Marshall. Now I'm not necessarily saying this is the same with every kind of amp. But when I plugged the Marshall in and clicked it down a couple notches, it still sounded like the Marshall to me. It didn't it didn't alter it that much. So you know, it, it is a good attenuator and. Um, but you know, I love the PS100. I do too. It's the it's the coolest. It's a great unit. Um, just solves all those issues. Somebody's saying, uh, how about scumbags? For I think back to the speaker thing about a high power greenback. I liked his. I was a fan of the M65. I thought it was a really good speaker. So um, I haven't. I don't really talk to Jim that much anymore, and I I don't know what's uh, anything that's going on with him right now. But um, but but that was a nice speaker, and he he did make a cool. It was coming at a time actually when there wasn't anything else that was kind of like that—a good high power vintage sounding greenback. And I think he influenced Celestion to make the greenbacks really, um, because they, they didn't have anything you could do that with. So, yeah, you could look at those and see, um, you know, M seventy five sixty five watt or M seventy five hundred watt. Just keep in mind every time you get more power, they roll up, the high end rolls off a little bit, and that goes for the red back too. I mean, it's a, it's a darker sounding speaker than a greenback while having a lot of that greenback character. You know, easy to test by listening to like Celestian's IRs. If you have access to those, you can listen to the red backs compared to the green backs compared to the cream backs. And you'll hear the kind of the difference in the in the top end. Uh, can Dave, oh, this is an interesting question for you. Can we talk about the PV VTM and similarities to your amps and how the Jose mods have evolved? I have a lot of fancy amps, but the VTM rules. <laughs> I kind of like that, that you like that. You know, the, the funny thing is the VTM, um, VTM's a cool amp. If you know how to set the switches, it could be bad if you don't know how to set the switches too. So with that, you can get pretty much most things from, um, it, so that's sort of like a JCM 800 meets Jose. So that I mean, that's where they started. It's kind of started with the, the the butcher, and then they added some features of a Jose to it. So if the switches are in a certain position, it's not a dead nuts Jose, but a pretty close. And, Maybe even a little more gain because oh uh, yeah, it's the flipping diodes too. Oh, it does. Uh, but with the postmaster, doesn't have the pre master, so right. it's never going to get massively gainy. But uh, you can you can set it. Uh, I, I can't tell you what that is because I'd have to look at the schematic to actually see again what the switches are. Um, but there's a way you can mostly set it up like exactly like a Jose, and it could be almost exactly a Jose front end at least if I made one slight change. Interesting. There's Little a little sleeper, bit of yeah. DNA from the the uh, 800. But it's good. It sounds it sounds really good. I have one. You have one? Yeah, it's it's, it's in the shop. Fire it up. Let's listen to it. <laughs> I want to hear it. I want to mess oh, with it. Yeah, I'll set it up. It's pretty cool, actually. I should make a video of that, like the sleeper, and then it'll go up in price and all that. Okay, let me, let me throw it back in the box, and then, then you know the funny thing about those amps, you know, the big and ugly PV thing, right? Uh, with the slanted front and the chassis, which actually serves a purpose. I understood that thinking. Yeah, because the face of it is slightly slanted. So if you're looking at the amp and you're looking standing in front of it, looking kind of down at it, the controls are slightly slanted upward at right. you. It's cool. It really makes sense when you think about it. Um, but <clears throat> so the head box must be made out of lead. So the, the actual wood cabinet, just empty, weighs 
so much you won't believe it. <laughs> no amp. With no amp in it. This is back in the, the day. Head box is like a lead anchor. Do you remember when you got that amp in for Neil Young? That was that thing with the handle on top. Oh my god, that's the greatest thing ever. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, what is that? The uh, um, <laughs> what is that amp called? Shoot. I don't know, but it was like okay. So this amp, he gets it in the shop to Baldwin it, Exterminator. And oh my god, it exterminate your the Baldwin your Exterminator, shit. right, man? Is 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 this this? <laughs> I mean, it's about as wide as a super reverb, but it's about three super reverbs high. <laughs> this high, yeah. But it was this high to me, the, and it has a handle on top. The funniest thing about it is there's a handle on top, and I go, "What? What is this handle made for? Is this made like, for? Uh, is this made for? Uh, you know, like the, the, the giants from? Well, there's no. I was trying to. Oh, okay, guys, I'll see you later. I'm just going to take my. Uh, <laughs> It weighs 120 pounds. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, I just it like it was baffling, and it looked like an old piece of bowling equipment from a bowling alley. <laughs> One of the weirdest uh, things I've ever seen. It's, it was like a, a stereo amp too, and it had like a a 15, a, like a, a a 10, and and some other little speaker. So there's like six speakers in it, hmm. <laughs> and uh, and it's a solid state amp. Yeah. But the funny thing about it is when it was fixed, it sounded incredible. It, it, you're like <laughs> listening to it. You're listening to it going, I, I totally want one of these. <laughs> I mean, like it, it, it was, it, it would break up in like this really warm, cool way. And like you were, yeah. and it had like incredible uh, verb and trim in it and stuff. So yeah. like, you're Which listening to it going, holy crap, this is amazing. Like semi broken, clean kind of tone, and it sounded huge. And like nine speakers, like all these different. I, got it. I understood why you used it after hearing. It. I was like, oh, yeah, I get it. Okay, that's so crazy. Uh, somebody's asking about ETA on Synergy Sin Two ahead. Sweetwater saying early October. I, I you wouldn't know that, that right? You're no, not. No. Yeah, that's Dave's Friedman. Everything's backed up. That's all I can tell you. Dave Friedman is Friedman, but not. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, what else we got here? Uh, my niece hurt says my box is noisy somewhere, but not somewhere else. You know, it just depends. I mean, it could be the that's a too complex question to answer. It could be could be the, the, the power of someone else's house or something. Or okay, it could be well, the, you, know. you you say that, but is, is your box super noisy? So with nothing plugged into your box, is it noisy? Right. The guitar right. cable pulled out. Right. Uh, so that's the true judge of the amp noise. So anything else is is EMF through coming the, through the pickups, through the guitar pickups, and that's right. And, and location to location will vary. Uh, you know, I remember going to see my uh, my my friend that is deceased now, Kenny, and I go see him at this one bar one time. And his playing with his cover band, which was he was they were great. Um, <laughs> he had to like shut his volume off so fast in between mm. things because there must have been some dimmer in the place or something because it was literally like Argh! right, <laughs> insane. He's like, what the fuck is this? Like I'm telling you, they have these lights dimmed or something. That's a problem. Yeah, just crap in the air. I mean, it's it. You get those gigs occasionally that are just like I, I used to carry a Rockfront Smart Gate in my in my guitar vault for I just pull it out and put it in front if I had to, you know, because it well, was, uh, well, I had one for you. So the guitar tech for Slash calls me, hmm. and you know, I had built his rigs and stuff, and he's like, "Yeah, man, you know, I'm getting this sound, this noise. It sounds like a digital thing, like thing, blah blah blah." And he, and he goes, and and we you know we just have the amp plugged in and the guitar straight into the amp now. And I go with the guitar off. He goes, yeah, or unplugged. Mm -hmm. I go, it's still making the noise. Yeah. Well, like it's got to be bleeding into the tubes wherever you are. You know, it's yeah. bleeding into the tubes. Yep. So I go, here's what you do. Do me a favor. Is is anyone else having the problem? No, they're okay. Like Richard, is Richard's stuff fine? Yeah, Richard's stuff's fine. 
okay, take that amp, walk it over to the other side of the stage, plug it in over there, and plug the plug plug your guitar in. Mm. Yeah, it's fine over there. Well, it's just where you're at. So in the end, they moved all the stuff to stage left. Oh, really? <laughs> the whole rig. So both the guitar players were on stage left. And then ran. Oh, the amps and everything. The, the cabinet. The whole rig. The whole no. rig moved. Well, the cabinets probably stayed where they were, but the cabinets whole, stayed. But the the rig, whole, whole yeah. rig moved. Yeah, I had a problem in Japan with. And it was with, fine. I, I had a problem in Japan with. Um, one venue and it, you know what it happened to be in france too and i'm telling you both times was where we were filming it was it was filming the dvd one night filming the dvd the other night it was like both those times noisy ass venues but i was getting a high-pitched weird whine coming through and you no know, guitar and still coming through still coming through and then i started to play with proximity of my amp and once again this gets back to the tube shield thing you know um i could i started to realize that if i put we had these uh like I don't know what the hell they were. They were for they were like aluminum shields for something like cl like cloth ones for and I don't even remember where we got them from. But I put one of those up and it's got better <laughs> around the amp, you know. And it was like oh okay. And so I think I had to have the amps positioned a certain way, you know, like like a change with their one eighty, you know. Yeah, from yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah Steve Stevens just went through that too. They yeah, moved the amp rack slightly to the one direction you know and yeah and it gets better and because he said i'm even getting it through my acoustic di <laughs> uh i'm like going okay well just shit in the air it's like what can you do um steve says uh he wants to build a 2204 type amp with a parallel gain stage what do you think of that what's that mean parallel gain stage what do you mean the first gain stage being in parallel no i don't like it doesn't sound that good like both sides of the tube pushing mm -hmm. so it, it generally it never sounds as good as it does with just half that's the jose did that sometimes right uh there were some amps that he did that on not too many but some uh i've seen uh and matchless does that mm. and uh, a lot of amps different yeah. it technically adds more voltage gain out of the first stage meaning it it's like hotter coming out. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. It hasn't sounded that good. Yeah, I didn't. I wish you, it did. You showed me, and I didn't like it. I don't think I like yeah, it. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Miss Ann Throw says, "Poor slash." You know what? I've been to his house in Bel Air. He's. Fine. I think he's okay. He's okay. Yeah, it's he's uh he's doing okay. He can deal with a little RF every now and then. You should see where he lives. Uh, I missed somebody's super chat. That's Patrick. Patrick, where are you in your super chat? I'm going to find you right now. There's another one, Edward. I'm going to get to you, Steve. Oh, God. I'm sorry, you guys. We get <laughs> here. here we go. I uh, just bought a 72 Super Lead. What? We were just talking about 72 Super Leads yesterday. Oh, man. They're good amps. Uh, I've got a 7250 watt back there. Um, it's great, Dave, right? As good as any 72 you've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. like, he had this 100 watt in yesterday, and he's like, this amp's great. It's a 72. And I'm like, I've got a 72. Is it better? And he's like, this one's particularly good. And I'm like, my amp better be as good as that amp. But anyway, uh, what tubes came in them originally? Probably Mollards. Probably Mollards originally. RFT maybe, but maybe not. Probably Mollards. Yeah, most, like, most likely Mollards at that time. In that era? Yeah. yeah. I just saw yesterday that Tad, tube amp doctor, now has an EL34M that they are claiming is like a Blackburn Mollard. I'm like, where did that come from? I almost ordered Solvtech. some last night. What's that? Solvtech. Tube amp doctor? Yeah. Because tube amp doctor has all sorts of tubes from all sorts of manufacturers. Oh. You think it's a <laughs> Russian? You think it's just the Russian? The there is no Chinese. So the majority of their tubes, they would use uh, Chinese. I don't know, but um, they have they still have some like other weird black plate stuff and everything. They might have some left. Yeah, but there's no Chinese. Interesting. Currently, still. So you think the you think that that the, this new tube that they just added is just the Mullard reissue from uh, from yeah. Matthews? I haven't seen it, so I can't be one hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure. I'll show it to you later, and we'll try and figure it yeah. out. I almost ordered. Well, there's only there's there's only 
that it's Chinese, right? Or Sotec factories, or JJ. Well, but the only thing about them is they do do some. The only thing that, that I say that's because they do their proprietary weird stuff. They, they do their proprietary stuff, but again, it comes from the Chinese factory or the yeah or the Sotec factory, and I've never seen the Sotec factory do proprietary anything. Right, right, and no, and, and the JJ. I'm just not sure it's that, but we're, we're going to look later. Get back to us on that. Uh, Steve L says, I want to build it. Oh, no, we already did that one. Wait, that one? another Ed, Ed, uh, Edbert. Thanks for the live stream. As always, do you find Sir guitars hi-fi sounding compared to conventional or traditional guitars? Uh, it depends on the model. Like, some of them have a more modern thing. I mean, like, if you take the, the new... Uh, you know, sort of standard series that they did with EMGs and stuff. That's going to be, you know, go to 510 steel saddles and uh, EMGs. Of course, that's going to be more modern, you know. Um, but if we're talking about bent steel, well, well, like a big, okay, a big one is that if you get a six screw bridge and with bent saddles, that's a huge factor yeah. to me in, right? Also, maybe with what it's painted with, too. Yeah, I I feel like I, I, a long time ago, I'm just saying a long time ago when, when you, we used to be a dealer for stuff, I, yeah. I, I would see a difference between, a, say, a nitro painted guitar from Sir versus uh, the regular. Mm. And I don't really know, but it seemed to be definitively, you know, really different. It seemed to be different. Well, my, uh, I mean, vintage, vintage style. Also, how, how is those. the neck finish too? You know, is it more raw or is it one of the finished? I, everything, everything comes into play. Uh, yeah. yeah, the big ones to me, I guess, are probably pickups and and wood and uh, the type of wood and stuff and the and the bridge and the saddles. If you those things, all those things, um, are the things that are probably going to make the biggest difference to me. I think, but um, you know, I think if you get a six screw, if you want it to sound really traditional, a six screw trim not a 510 with with the solid steel saddles as opposed to a six screw with bent that's a pretty big difference i think and um then depending on what pickups you go to and stuff you know the um yeah. i mean i think the, the 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 v63s uh which were originally the landau classics those are really greasy sounding and really cool and mm -hmm. also the the v60 lps you know some of their pickups are a little brighter sounding it depends like the 70s are kind of bright and wiry they're lower up lower wind um but you got to take all that stuff into account you know when we're talking about is anything with the, the two post goto 510 with the steel the solid steel saddles is going to be a slightly different sound but like john always says you know when it comes to the woods he goes fender doesn't have magic trees or something <laughs> they don't you know the wood is you know the wood is wood and it's like there's yeah. that, all things equal you can repeat you know i mean you know you can I, I think, you know, uh, if that makes sense. Hope that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Here's somebody. This is the Baldwin Exterminator Blue, that Neil Young crazy amp, 2.8 inch, 2.12. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. I mean, imagine the weight, 215s. <laughs> That's big. Oh, the whole thing was massive. It's cool, oh, though. God. This is crazy, you know. Uh, Guitar Hack says he has a run 20, run his effects in the front. Reverb course and delays are so exaggerated. Is that normal? Yes, that's normal. Yes. You're hitting gain. So the gain is compressing and blowing up the effects, essentially. Yeah, so you, have, uh, you have to use those in the loop, really, if you want, if you don't want that effect, basically. I yeah. mean, if you're running an amp mainly clean, it doesn't really matter. But um, anything dirty would definitely matter. You can get away with an echo You're button. Running in the loop, but let me okay. Let me tell you before you email me. <laughs> so in that amp, the loop return is wide open. Okay, so it comes it comes after the master on the amp. So if there's any faults in your pedal board, meaning like if your pedals are sitting on top of a pedal power, mm -hmm. um, uh, a a linear kind of base power supply or something. If your guitar cables are too are laying on top of your you know your wall wart that's in your power strip, and you go into the return, that return will pick up any kind of extraneous hum. Mm. Uh, there's a couple ways around that. One, you can make sure your pedal board power supply is done properly, all isolated outputs, 
and use a Friedman power supply or a Strymon or an Isobrick or a True Tone One Spot CS12, the bigger um, brick power supplies, all those are isolated and those are switching power supplies that have no field hum. Mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about the field hum part. You still also can't drape your cables on the return across the power transformer of the amplifier <laughs> either because that will cause hum. Mm -hmm. And if all else fails, what you can do, because you want if you're playing really quietly too, that could cause like kind of a gain structure issue. So you could buy JHS makes something called a little black box or a little or a black box. It's basically a two jacks and a volume pot. And you put that uh, after your effects loop chain before the return of the amp, and that's sort of your master volume. And then you can crank your channel masters up so the signal to noise ratio works better. In Got the it. future, in the future, uh, I've decided just because I got tired of getting emails about this, uh, that I will put a I will put a system volume on every amp I make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the future. Hey, we have that on my amp. It, it, it becomes it, well. It just it's just knowing. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I have that on the Deluxe too. Yeah. No. So, hey, so some of the some of the uh, say the Sir Badgers. I guess. I guess they don't have that. It's like a regular yeah. loop. But no. Well, like we, a dirty Shirley, like a, a dirty Shirley the loops before the master, like in that amp. But in some right. amps, it just you're trying to just it's a it's a lower cost amp and you're trying to just yeah yeah condense everything and make it simple it can work trust me you can do it it's just yeah, yeah marshall you're doing and you can't have like a, a bullshit pedal board into it pretty much every marshall with an effect loop and it doesn't have a return volume yeah 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 you can do it it just happens to be a little sensitive especially in that amp because there's not that much headroom in a 20 watt power section and it's just like it's right. a lot of gain on the return Mike's got an interesting point here, and I've experienced this too. I saw where a guy had posted his amp and suddenly developed a weird tremolo effect, and I suggested he turn his ceiling fan off, and the problem disappeared. I can remember certain times when I'm freaking out, like, why can't I get my guitar in tune? I hit one, thing? I, I'd hit a string, and it'd sound like, I, 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 like a weird, or, you know, like, and I'd even just one single string. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I'd realize there was air conditioning or a fan on in the room and it would be you know like yeah, and that'll yeah. actually change the you know it sounds like your guitar's out of tune it's crazy but that's yeah. a total thing i had i learned that one the wrong it's like stage way. fans when you're being attacked to uh yeah right the, <laughs> blowing the, at you on the guitar is like this is not yeah and it sounds like if you have a little amp or whatever it sounds like it's out of tune i think it's actually i don't know if it's blowing the air and changing the frequency or or, or what it's doing but it's well, crazy I mean, the wor I mean the worst part about that is too when it's 110 degrees it's like nah, I just don't care yeah <laughs> just give me the fan you do the best you can yeah uh there's some super chats here let's see what are these question for dave i have a lee jackson made amp uh the early days of modern amps what were the big difference from a jose to a lee well completely different type of circuit right the mod yeah completely different L later later on in life lee started doing mods a little differently but mostly what he did was he kind of put a gain stage later um like after the eq mm -hmm. uh it's hard to explain what he was trying to accomplish there it's very different though it's not like your typical cascaded mod uh, generally speaking uh, i mean i've heard a few of them that sound pretty cool but it's a hard amp to get the sound right though like the gain stage would be post eq before the phase inverter yeah it was it was kind of weird i need to have that mid kind of shift control yeah that was cool that's basically just changing the treble cap oh that's what that would do that's actually really cool and you can you can put that in any in any amp actually and it's really neat to listen to the different value of treble caps just like on the fly like that it's really because mm -hmm. cool. i remember remodding a few lee jackson amps and i always would leave that yeah because it was like oh yeah look at that it's a 250k 470 K uh, Pike or 250 Pico Fair, 470 Pico Fair, 001, 0022, and 0047, I think were the were the values. 2221, whatever it takes. Hmm? 
That was a joke. 220, 221, whatever it takes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what about Kiox? Kiox? What about Cox power supplies? Kiox. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Chocks? Is that how you say it? I think so, yeah. Uh, uh, Chocks, uh, the f anything from the future power um, generation yeah. or the newer switching power supply ones, those are really good. And really good, right? They're quite good because they will almost power anything. Yeah. Like With really high output current at nine volts, but they do nine, 12, 15, and 18. Yep. On each output. With like 550 or something million. Or yeah, it, change, it changes depending on what the voltage is, but it's. Uh, I've got one sitting right here. So. Yeah, they work really well. I like mine very much. That's I've used it on my desk yeah. as my main. And, and it's it, it great. You, yeah, USB. So I charge my phone out of it. Yeah. You know, the funny thing, at first I was like, you know, they have the RCA um, uh, jacks, you know, for the power. Yeah. But, and at first I was kind of like, it's ah, a little weird. I don't know. And then I started using them and I'm like, uh, it kind of makes a lot of sense. It's really tight. They don't fall out very easily. The, 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 the connection that they have is really good. Agreed. Like yeah. better than the, better than the little 3.5 yeah. or 8.5. Yeah, I agree. I quite, I quite like them actually. I thought it was weird too. And now it's like, that's oh, good. Now I'm used to it. Now it's fine. Uh, Ponder says, thanks, Pete and Dave, sharing your worlds with all of us amazing gear nerds. Thank you, man. Thanks for being here. Uh, this stream and Tone Talk are gold, by the way. Thank you. Uh, recently got a run 20. Couldn't be happier. A happy customer of yours. Hey, Excellent. thank you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is an interesting question. This is like my board. Can you explain how to run a pedal board through loop and through the front without using a second board? Dave's um, great patch box that he makes on his pedal boards works terrific for this. So my guitar goes into the Friedman patch bay box and it's got a buffered input. So I've got the buffered on, on and then it comes out of the patch point in the back of that box and goes through a couple pedals. My wah, a freak out, and a unit 67 from uh, dry bill. Then it goes to the front end of my switcher, which is a Musicom lab. All my gain pedals, compressor, an Echoplex pedal, all that is in the loops of the, 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 the switcher. The output of the switcher runs back to the Friedman patch box. And then there's an output coming out of there that runs to the front of my amp. There's the first part of the chain, right? Now the effects loop send comes back out of my amplifier, back into another patch point on the Friedman patch box, comes out of the back of the patch box into my wet effects chain, which is uh, a couple of H9s and a Boss um, 500 delay, 500 series delay. Um, I come stereo back out of there into two points on the Friedman patch box, come out of those back to the returns of two amplifiers generally sometimes one amplifier on a run in mono but that's it that patch box on there allows you to have it's got six patch points for quarter inch jacks and you can use them however you want and that's how i do it I've got but you, don't, you don't necessarily need a patch box to do it it's just it's pretty simple it's just like choose the effects that you want and run a cable from the sand into the whatever that chain is let's say it's uh Chorus, delay, and reverb. Let's just hypothetically say it's chorus, delay, and reverb. Okay, those chorus, delay, and reverbs are what I'm going to put in the loop. You just run a send into the chorus, out of the delay, or out of the reverb, into the uh, return. And then the other chain is just a separate chain in front of your amp. But what you do have to remember is that you need an isolated power supply because you can't have any common grounds between the post path and the pre path or you're going to get a ground loop. And that also means you can't have pedals touching any of the pre-path pedals either. So they can't like physically touch each other in any way because you'll get a ground loop. And I think you've got ISO transformers on my pedal board, like the one running to the front of the amp. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, it's probably yeah. like well, that's... No, maybe I don't. Uh... Yeah, I mean, but if you just have a basic pedal board, it's, you don't need to do that. So, so yeah. all of these isolated grounds and the two pedal chains aren't touching each other physically. Long story short, if you get ground noise, 
when you're setting up a rig like this, there's ways to solve it. But yeah, yeah I think you Absolutely. do have on mind that, but I'm just not 100% sure. Um, uh, Javier says, uh, happy Sunday. Thanks, man. And thanks for doing a super chat. I appreciate that. Oh, well, there's two down there. It's coming in hot and heavy with the super chats. Picked up an Ampeg V3 today, says Neil. The 50 watt version of the V7 I mentioned last week. Yeah, I remember. I'd never seen a V7. I've never yeah, heard yeah, of it. Yeah, right. yeah, it's wild. In fact, uh, I've never seen a V3. He says maybe Dave remembers from the early 80s. Yeah, yeah I only remember V3. That's interesting. Huh. V7. Ampeg was vastly overlooked, except for base amps. True. They were. And some cool stuff. Uh, Randy says, what are your favorite memories of Ed Van Halen? Oh, jeez. Oh, you know, uh, it, it, the, one of my favorite memories uh, was I had to fly out to um, – for Ed, I had to fly out to Detroit once, and I hadn't been in Detroit uh, for years, actually, um, for a million years before that. Uh, and I hadn't talked to a good friend of mine also in, in a million years. And I had emailed him. No, I didn't email him. So he runs a guitar store, Motor City Guitars, this guy named Marty. And um, I'm like, I, it was at the last minute that I was going to Detroit. So I'm like, okay, okay it's Sunday. I'm, I'm going to try. They're open. The store's open. I don't, I don't have his personal contact information. Let me just call the store. See if they'll give me his you know, cell phone number or something. Because I wanted to say hi and see him. Mm -hmm. And because uh, uh, it's been way too long. And um so I, uh, I called the store. He answered the phone. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm coming, you know, Hey, I'm coming out there. Uh, you know, I got to work for Van Halen and they're playing at the palace, which is no longer there now. And, uh, you know, I'd like to come see you or do you want to come hang out at the show? You know? So, and, and he goes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we meet, uh, he's at the sh he's hanging out with me while I'm working on the rig and stuff, you know, like backstage and and then it comes time for sound check later and you know he's with me and I uh, you know Ed comes out and uh, you know is thanking me for coming out and all this this stuff and and uh, and then I introduced my friend, you know, and I I called him he was like a brother to me growing up. And Ed just reaches over and grabs him into into like a bear hug, and gives him a kiss. So, why that's the best story for me is because never in a million years, as kids, when he and I were seeing all these shows, never in a million years would he be thinking that Eddie Van Halen would be giving him a hug and a kiss. <laughs> You yeah. know, and uh, and I, I just watched his face. <laughs> he didn't quite know what to do, but he was like, you know, and yeah. I knew that meant so much to him. That that was really cool, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's that, nice. That, just something that stood out in my brain that I just thought of. I mean, there's lots of stories, but yeah, you know, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, I, oh, that made him really happy. You know. Yeah. So, so that was that's cool. great. Yeah. That's a good one, man. Yeah, it's like I have similar, you know, there's many, many stories, but I can remember a few days. I, you know, the one day for me that I remember was going up there and it was like before, uh, it was before Christmas. So it was early December, I think. And I brought him a, uh, a gift. I brought him a phaser. And uh, it was from Retrosonic. Yeah. They make nice, you know, so it was very accurate phase 90 clone, but I had it. Uh, um, the guy from Retrosonic was really nice and helped me with this, but he had it engraved on the back. I think I think it was engraved, not printed. Might have been screen printing. I can't remember. But anyway, you know, said for Christmas, whatever, you know, 
uh, 2009, whenever it was or something, you know, and I brought it up there and I gave it to him. And you know how he was when you, if you did something like that, like how he could get almost choked up or, he yeah, could, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, cause it was different. It was like kind of, you know, it was just a little thing, you know, but that was the day, I think that was the day I went up there and he was standing there playing guitar, uh, in the, so the first, that was the first crazy thing was he was standing playing guitar in the door of 5150, <laughs> you know, like when I pulled up and got out of the car and it was this blaring loud guitar coming out of the studio. And I was like, Oh yes. You know? and, and then he stood in front of me and just played for about 15 minutes when I walked in and it was unbelievable. So I'll never forget that. But then I brought him this phaser that day and it, we sat down and he was particularly relaxed that day. I remember uh you know just super chill and he's like i brought him my new rec my record i remember that a song that i had when it was revenge of the nerd i remember i had a mix of it and it was done and stuff and i brought him that and he said i want to hear this and we put it on and listened to it in 5150 and he sat and he i remember there's one tapping lick going into the second chorus and it's this i don't even know i don't know how i did it i couldn't play it right now if, if you paid me but um i he looked at me like <laughs> when that lick went by and that that moment for me like when he was listening yeah. to you know what i mean and he was like responding to it and he was like what the hell was that and i was like if you would you know as a kids you know I never yeah, would right, right 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 yeah i mean it just blew my mind and then he played me some music you know and i heard some songs that he goes check this out we just recorded this the other day and it was like a complete amazing cool van halen song that didn't go on the next record and that was you know i remember saying did you send this to Dave? Like, is he gonna? And and he's like, ah, I don't think he's gonna like it. I don't know. I just remember him being like, and I was like, why? It's amazing. It like had background vocals on it and everything, and it had a you know it had a title, but it didn't have any lead vocals on it or a melody. But it was great. And I always remember him. He was just excited. And he was in this loose mood. And I remember the drums came in. It was this great groove, and he was like going like this, like like aping the drums, you know. And then the solo had this one note where it was a little bit like the solo to how do I know when it's love, you know, that song when it's love and it's got that long soaring kind of phrase at the beginning. Except this was one note. He bent it and he was just holding it and holding it. And he was like doing that while it was playing, you know, and he was like, yeah, I just wanted to milk like one note forever, you know, and it was so great. He was so into it. And so I was just going, this is amazing right now. Like, you know, it's just so cool. And then I, you know, I gave him this phaser and he go, oh man, like, and he ran in the other room. He goes, he goes, here, 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 I got to give you this. And he gave me a wah, you know, a, uh, one of the yellow and black stripe wahs, mm -hmm. you know, cause he just yeah. felt like, he's like, this is so cool. And then he goes, do you want some, oh, oh, get, uh, let me get some shoes for you. <laughs> and he went and got me the stripe, shoe, the Converse, what size do you wear? You know, and he's got like all these shoes in the other room, like boxes and boxes of the, of the, the Converse. You know, so he gives like I'm walking out of there with a wall and a pair of shoes that he gave me. <laughs> and it was the most chill, awesome afternoon, you know. It was just and then of course the big hug and the kiss on the cheek and everything. And it was just like it was good vibes. And I just I'll never forget that day, you know. It was like it was the coolest. So that's 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 my one memory of uh, that 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 always pops up. Like that day was really cool and special, you know. No bad vibes, no, you know, it was just great. Yeah, yeah. Anyways uh what a dude um old metal dude speaking of dude says uh dave i have your 112 cab with the cream back in my jj jr head love it it sounds great but i'm curious why did you choose that speaker well Which i didn't want to put a minus 30 in hmm. so I, and, and i needed something higher power mm. uh so i doesn't have that many choices. So I wanted something a little more greenbacky flavor. And, although, you know, and I say a little bit more greenbacky flavor. It's not exactly a greenback. Um, but powery power. So I just picked that. That was available at the time. Um, I mean, I might use the red back now. I don't know. But we still do those. They, they hold up fine in the in the close back uh, ported cabinets. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. The cap sounds really good. So, Maybe, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of a single V30 with anything. Well, as with anything, I think your your speaker choice is based on the cabinet design. Yeah. Uh, because like in our two twelve cabinet, um, I like the vintage thirties in it because of the cabinet design. I like two twelve though. 
a 212, yeah. I like how it sounds in the particular cabinet. I sure. You compare it, if you're comparing the 212 to a 412, I thought that the vintage 30s added a little more punch that you're missing a lot of times in a 212. Yeah. And, and, and when you compared it to the blended 4x12, they were relatively close. If I put any other speaker combination in there and then I beat it, it wasn't so close, you know, it was, yeah, yeah. It was different. So I chose those and, and generally speaking, they work in the 212 work particularly good, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it depends on the cabinet. It really does. Uh, yeah. It depends again. Sorry, people. It depends. <laughs> Sorry, John. But also the amp, uh, PT15 IR and PT15, we came out with a 112 cabinet, like last year, matching 112, and I was all ready to go with a V30. And I thought, that's eh, it's easy. You know, it's just like, that makes sense. It'll handle the power, no problems. Get good in the 112. They, and SIRS had V30 112 forever. And I thought, I, be I better go out and just not, I I'm not, I'm not going to be lazy. I should go and take a listen to it. Went and listened to it. And as soon as I plugged the amp in and I tried it, I was like, the PT15 on the gain channel. I mean, it's got some pop end on the mm -hmm. on the uh, on the on the gain channel. Not as much as like a Plexi or something, but there's a character to it. And I tried the V30. I thought this just sounds a little raspy. I don't know. Okay, all right. Let's hear. Let's hear. Let's a crane back 75. We did that. Plugged in. I was just like, I, yeah. around, I looked at everybody else in the room, and they were like, ah. Uh, because the problem was that they had a whole, but they had like pallets of 60, yeah, but no way them, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was like, we're going to have to order a whole. And I was like, but listen, and everybody was like, John and, and Chris and everybody in the amp, you know, we were. Wait, yeah, why, so, why did that matter? Getting a pallet? No, but if, if they had 16, why did they use 16? Oh, because they like doing eight ohm caps generally because it's more versatile with different like they a lot of their amps like a badger doesn't even have a 16 ohm so they just like doing eight ohm in the 112 they like doing eight ohm in a 412 it's just something they like yeah to do. I don't do that. it's just something they like to do so 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 we went for you know the eight ohm um but uh it just sounded better it just sounded better now the v30 and the greenback blended in the 212 that sounded Great. The two eight two actually seventy five creambacks in our two twelve sounded really good too. But when I heard the greenback and the V thirty, you know what that yeah, it works. <laughs> right cabinet, that sounds great. So it works. Yeah, it works really well. Once again, John, it depends. That all came from um, that whole blend thing came from years ago doing Jerry Cantrell's room. Mm. A million years ago in the nineties, early nineties, doing Jerry Cantrell's rig. And in, in the room, we had uh, two 4x12s, and one was a V30 loaded 4x12, and one was a, a greenback loaded 4x12. Mm -hmm. So when we plugged in this stereo rig at the time with the power amp, we had one of each cabinet going. And it just sounded godly that way. And when we tried it with the same speakers, it didn't sound the same way. Yeah. So that's where the idea of the blend came from Yeah. long time ago. And, uh, and then later, I just did it in a cabinet. And the reason I did it with greenbacks on top and vintage thirties on bottom, where it was you know the greenbacks friendlier to your ear, right? And 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 the, you know the v, the V thirties punchy and, and bright, and uh, I, I thought that should be down at your feet. You don't want to hear that as much, you know. Yeah, it's and, also just louder. I mean, the V thirty yeah. two dB. But I, yeah, but I think I think it's just it works it works out well that way. Yeah, I, I got to go back to my old buddy, Al Vermeule, in the 80s, who always had a great sound. And um, he used to use Marshall cabs, and then he had the high watt with the port in it. That yeah. sounded unbelievable. And he loaded it with old vintage greenbacks and, and G12 H30s. And mm -hmm. he had the H30s in the bottom and the greenbacks in the top, I do believe. He might have an X pattern at some point, but I think they were the 25s in the top. And so this is going back to 88 or 89 hearing his cabinets and I can remember he used to put his cabinet off stage for a while uh kind of either off to the side of the stage or in the in the back because he used to run really loud and he was what he was one of the first guys I ever saw doing kind of wet dry stuff too 
Mm-hmm. And uh, he always had an amazing sound. He was really a smart guy, with a great guitar player, a smart guy, really into his rig and had a great tone. I can remember standing particularly once in Calgary backstage at a club and he was on stage playing and this i was standing right in front of his cabinet mic'd up with the with the greenbacks and the and the h30s in it and his sound was killer it just sounded great and he used to use the duncan convertible amps and he had a certain module combination in it, it sounded amazing i mean they hey, were man. notoriously unreliable but holy shit, he had a good sound anything can work depending on the player and what you know what their hands are like yeah yeah it's like i've seen some stuff where you look down and you're going wow he's getting that sound out of that wow yeah cool totally oh that's really cool <laughs> no. yeah amazing like ty Tabor or something you know the ultimate mm-hmm. you know um to conserve the amp tubes assuming you're stepping away for an hour or two is it better to turn off the amp or leave it on probably turn it off right just off yeah i mean turning it off probably it's fine right it's doesn't probably doesn't even matter either way, but standby is kind of bullshit, right? Yeah, you know, it doesn't need to be there. It's a mute. It's not really doing anything. Some some say it might even be harder on the amp. Hmm. Um, but uh, you can turn it off. I mean, it's no big deal. Just make sure you you know go up and turn it on. You know, a few minutes before you gotta actually play your first note. So so it comes all the way on. Right. Yeah. Uh, Evan there in the super chat as well. Thanks for doing the super chat, Austin. Uh, Evan as well says, in experience with Vox Classic Plus series. What's that? Mm, yeah, I agree. I don't know. No. Is that like a newer? Let me take a look. Let's see, sometimes I like to like when somebody asks me a question, I don't know. I'll go search it really quick. I'm not too familiar with, I mean, oh, I remember these when they came out with these at NAM. Yeah. They're more like a like a two channel full on affair with switching and stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't really know anything about these. To be honest, it looks like they were pretty cheap. They were probably made maybe in you know they're making apps in Vietnam and stuff. I think. No, of course they're made. They're, all the boxes were made somewhere else. Yeah. And then, of course, do the, you know, like the, the, the hand wired. Did you see a few years ago when they came out with the, was it 60th anniversary or something version of the AC30 that was looked really beautiful and was five grand or something, you know? And mm-hmm. that, that's interesting to me. <laughs> I like that stuff more. But uh, at least when it comes to Vox, you know. Yeah, uh, sure that wasn't made here either. Ah, uh, I think they were. Those were UK hand wired situation that was part of their. Yeah. Yes, they were like really expensive and they were limited to, you know, maybe 60th anniversary. Thing. Marshall make them or something? Uh, Fox 60th anniversary. Look here, real quick. Let's take a look. Limited is an AC30 HW60, it was called. Oh no, that's a yeah three chat. It's a three channel, you know, with the it's it's the full yeah. on full on dealio, and they went for uh, a lot of money. Yeah, forty eight ninety nine used on eBay. I'm seeing one right now, but they sure look nice. Um, <laughs> hand wired sixty. Uh, yeah, they look gorgeous on the inside too, like the uh, the build and everything, but. 1960 it's a, it's an exact 1964 ac30 slash six situation that's what they were going for uh available in limited quantities in 2017 um and uh, uh they look they look amazing but um no longer in production so let's not talk about it anymore all right what else we got here uh dave do you still make the 215 what 215 212 cab? What is that? Yeah, like? what's that? That's a very large cabinet. Oh, is that like for the your fellow the Mastodon? Yeah. Mm. Uh, it it uh it it is special order, but we do it. That's cool. Uh, what do you guys prefer? Wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, mono, dual mono. Depends on the, what you're going for. Oh boy, it depends. <laughs> 
You know, to, to be honest, I, I think I think maybe stereo can sometimes be overrated. Uh, I'm going to quote Bob Bradshaw on that. <laughs> uh, you know, a mono thing can be great. Uh, it's it's fine, and in a lot of respects, when you really think about, like, are you the only guitar player in the band? Right. If it, if you're the only guitar player in the band, you can almost do whatever you want. But if you're multiple guitar players, what the hell do you do with the stereo thing? Yeah, well, that's a problem I ran into. You know, it's like, what do you do, really? It's it, yeah. it might sound great to you on stage, but really, I mean, yeah. a mono rig with just some effects on will probably be better because they can pan it in any direction they want, you know? Yep. Um, as far as wet-dry, that's kind of cool because, you know, you get your unaffected and your affected cab. That's super cool. Uh, this is too, like, stereo? I don't know. It's too broad. Like it's like, do you are we talking about the way Scott Henderson does wet dry, or are we talking about the way that Eddie Van Halen does it, or the way that Eric Johnson and Larry Carlton did it with you know Mike Piquet, or the way that Shanks does it? You know, there's all these different ways. There's those the wet dry or wet dry wet. There's as many different. There's three or four different varieties of those rigs that are vastly different. That they're almost like their own thing. That are good mm -hmm. for different. You know, I mean, the the rock way of doing it is that when all when all effects were off, all three cabinets were dry, and and mm -hmm. they were of equal volume. Right. So uh, and then the effects would just come on in the outside cabinets. So right. that sounds massive, and that that was that was the. Joe Holmes, uh, Eddie Van Halen, Steve Stevens, kind of wet, dry, wet kind of yeah. thing. And, but then right. there's then there's the just wet thing, where where you know you have a wet and a dry. So the wet is literally 100% wet, and you're just blending in. You don't need even need a big power amp for that. You're just blending in a little bit of it because you know it's what the, you know maybe. 20% of your sound would be the, the effect and then the rest would be, you know, so you don't need a lot of power uh, in doing that. I don't generally like that that much. You know, I don't, I don't really either, but I say that that's the way Landau does it and that's the way Scott Henderson does it, but they do it in the unique Correct. way of running into the front end of a combo amp with the wet signal. So it becomes... Well, they didn't always. I mean, Mike used to do that same thing with a Marshall power amp. Okay, but Marshall anytime Smith. I've seen him in the last twenty years or whatever, he's been doing the correct. Which, which actually, I don't particularly care for that much. You don't like it as much. I think it's and it works fine. I mean, I guess because it's a hundred percent wet, and it almost doesn't matter. Well, yeah, the, the, when I saw good. when I saw Scott doing it and explained it to me, and then I, I I wouldn't have thought it would have worked. So they're they're taking it. It's the head, the cabinet, line out box with the tap off the head. And it goes into the effects yeah. and comes out of the effects into the front end of a combo and it's set 100 percent wet and now you've got like a, a typically a fender combo both those guys would use and you can eq the effects and just use bring up the volume but it's got all this because you're running right into the front end of, of an amp so it's kind of juiced up and has some compression to it and you can just blend in and, and scott would do it using a little hot rod deluxe i think and landau would use his super reverb or, or his mic Fender amp, I think. The, the, uh, yeah, maybe also a hot rod deluxe style. But uh, it when those guys did it, I was like, oh, that actually works. And so I, I think for them, it works great. You know, it's a cool, it's a cool sound. Mm -hmm. And the goal with them doing it, I know, was to keep the keep keep the dry dry, you know, and then keep the wet out of those speakers so that the guitar is more connected. Whereas I feel like with the Eddie Van Halen or Steve Stevens thing. Like you say, overall dry in all three cabinets. It's got lots of dry mixed in in in, in the wet cabs yeah. as well. And then you're just adding the effects, and it's a yeah. different thing. It's more. Huge. But you still you still have the direct center cab that is pure. So, I think the goal there is stereo and massive. You know, in a band yeah, that has guitar based center. drums, it's just kind of fun. But I. Uh, I did that and I ran into the problem. You said it worked great with Melissa Etheridge. When I went to Don Henley doing it, it was like there's two keyboard players and another guitar player and background singers and sometimes a horn section. It was like, this is ridiculous. The other guitar player with uh, his PV Classic 50 amp and a few pedals in front sounded more in the PA and focused than I yeah. did with all that shit. So it didn't work. Uh, right. I mean, I did fine. I had good tone and everything, but it would weigh too. It's like, you're better off with a. You know, if, if I was playing with Don again, I might use the Sir Hedgehog, actually. 
a more fender style amp uh and mono you know just with some pedals and yeah. you know that would be it because that would work great for that situation more focused sound um somebody saying i missed their question that's evan evan what was your question and i'm sorry if i missed it we can we can tend to ramble oh there you are uh oh the vox classic plus series no we did answer that uh i don't know anything about them i don't know anything about them but we should probably split soon right yeah i gotta go pretty much i think you do okay uh let's see if there's anybody else here at the end with anything interesting you guys or you guys are done with guitar for today right that's enough for one day we've had a good a good discussion the 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 theme for the day is when it comes down to the pickups because that was the main reason then we digressed but the the theme for the day with the pickups is it depends the, it depends that's right, that's right. <laughs> sorry john but yeah honestly for me, it came down to the uh, the distortion pickups were were a unique and cool that one Van Halen one and maybe a few songs on Van Halen two kind of situation. If you want that sound, the most easily readily available way would be a super distortion, I think. But the, the vintage Mighty Might was pretty special. And then with the other pickups, uh, we were both fans, I think, of uh, generally speaking, those A2. Uh, prior passing in white the, the rewind the 78 was cool too that was cool those lower gain kind of things the 14k ones are cool too if you like a little more juice the alnico too you feel like you just want a little more gain under your fingers but this is all amp dependent and guitar dependent and so like in an older body with a rosewood fingerboard maybe the a5 like the second degree black belt or the uh vh2 from bare knuckle that was yeah. a great sounding pickup too. Really great sounding pickup, you know. So, and a good old Duncan Fifty Nine or Custom Custom or Seventy Eight. There's nothing wrong with those at all, you know. My favorite. I'll just if people want to know. My favorite was the Pasadena uh, White uh, Pariah White Pasadena. Mm -hmm. What's it called? That one. Pasadena I White. Love, I really love that one. Honorable mention. Every it was, only pickup I didn't like at all was the friggin' Super Seventy. <laughs> yeah. That didn't work at all. I didn't think. Like, oh, that's definitely not something I want but um, the other ones were all cool takes cool flavors and of course props to my buddies at serve because I really actually enjoyed the 8.6 K a2 Thornbucker and we're looking at something like that for the future so just, I gotta wind it up hotter and stuff like that and I've been messing around so we'll see but anyways thanks for doing the uh, thanks for doing the show yeah of course and uh, always good to see you don't know when I'll see you again Probably tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, everybody, thanks for doing your super chats and stuff. And if I miss any questions, we're really sorry. Uh, I hope not. Uh, and uh, you guys have a terrific week. And uh, rock on, rockers. See you guys later.